Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. For today's video we are going to look at the second in the Divergence series in Surgeon. We're doing that. My makeup feels disgusting and I don't want any comments being like, oh actually it looks it looks really nice and camera real easy. It don't look it in real life and it don't feel it. If it looks good on camera that's because I am phenomenally talented at makeup, nothing more. Rimmel London recently went cruelty free and they have a little vegan line so not in lieu of that. Because of that, I decided, oh, I'll buy some of their products. It's been a billion years since I've bought any. And it's the type of makeup where it just feels greasy. It's not nice. It feels like if I touched my face right now, layers would come off of my finger. That's what it feels like. Gross, don't like it. It's already like settling into fine lines and things like that because I'm well old. Anyway, insurgent bit of a slog to get through, not gonna lie, a bit like the first one. In fact, at some points I got so bored of doing this that, and I swore I wouldn't do this, I started up the sequel to Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades Darker, and I was having well loads of fun with that. Unfortunately, with Fifty Shades Darker, it's already, the script is already at like 30 or so pages, and I'm on chapter five, because literally every other sentence there is something wrong with it, it's fantastic, it's so fun. This, in comparison, was just boring to get through. But first, today's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> That's right, this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. It's back and better than ever. Or so I'm told. I have made a deal with Raid Shadow Legends that may or may not have included my soul and or my firstborn to bring you the following information. Raid is the first mobile game ever made, first discovered in 6000 BC. When they first dug up Raid Shadow Legends in the sands of Egypt, some say that a curse befell the land. Plants withered and died, locusts swarmed the cities, and people kept stepping on pieces of Lego. But it was all worth it to get hundreds of artifacts and over 600 sweet, sweet champions. Raid your way like a shadow legend. Raid has just released a super powered legendary version of everybody's favourite champion, Death Knight. The whole Raid community has been waiting for this for a very long time. No! And Ultimate Death Knight is everything that we hoped for. Just look at him. No, really. Look at him. Ultimate Death Knight has a solid kit that will help players progress through dungeons, Doom Tower, Clan, or Hydra Boss. Or so I'm told. But don't worry, we can hear from the Bone Daddy himself in an exclusive interview with Death Knight. Raid, please let my family go, I beg. Hello from me, and hello from Mr. Nibbles. So, DK, can I call you that? You know what DK stands for? Donkey Kong. I heard his armor is made of paper mache. Uh. Between you and me, how much is Raid paying you to be a Death Knight? Oh, hell no. Uh, sorry, but uh, I can't talk about this. Anything else to add? I heard he downloads movies. Oh. <gasps> or so I'm told. And right now, Raid's running an amazing trick-or-treat promotion, Halloween, where you can win a bunch of real-life and in-game prizes, including $1,000 Amazon gift cards and some of the best epic and legendary Halloween champions in Raid. The best part? It's all for free, and it's super easy. All you need is your Raid player ID. Just download Raid on my link in my description, and then head to trickortreat.playerium.com to make things even easier. I linked that in the description too. Wow, how presumptive. From there, just enter your details and spin the wheel and get your prize. That's it. Don't wait around. This special event runs October 15th to November 5th. And once it's over, it's over. So be fast. There's seriously never been a better time to get started, but there's more. You can also use the DK Rises promo code for a bunch of free items to instantly level your sh new strongest champion all the way to level 50. Five star ascension. Promo code is available for both new and existing players. And if you haven't started playing Raid yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen. And you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Aina, 200,000 silver, one energy refill and one XP boost and one ancient shard. So you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. 
So thank you so much Ray Shadow Legends for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on with it. Now let's get on with it. Chapter one, I wake with his name in my mouth. Four, no, will. The book picks up directly where the first left off on the train on the way to the Amity compound. They get to the fence, which is locked. Let's hope the erudite didn't think to change this combination, he says, as he types in a series of numbers. He stops at the eighth one, and the gate clicks open. How did you know that, says Caleb. His voice sounds thick with emotion, so thick I'm surprised it does not choke him on the way out. I worked in the Dauntless control room, monitoring the security system. We only change the codes twice a year, Tobias says. How lucky, says Caleb. He gives Tobias a wary look. Very convenient indeed. Marcus opens one of the doors. I'd be shocked by the lack of security if we are not at the Amity headquarters. They often straddle the line between trust and stupidity. How have the hippies not been wiped out sooner? Marcus stops before an open room where Joanna Reeves, representative of Amity, sits staring out the window. I recognise her because it is hard to forget Joanna's face, whether you've seen her once or a thousand times. A scar stretches in a thick line from just above her right eyebrow to her lip, rendering her blind in one eye and giving her a lisp when she talks. I have only heard her speak once, but I remember. She would have been a beautiful woman, if not for that scar. Oh yes, the old, uh, should be beautiful if it weren't for that damn scar trope. The hippie leader lets them stay for the night, but the Dauntless must hand over their weapons, so they hand over most of them, but keep a gun. Smart, one page down, 62 to go. An Amity nurse gives me a salve, developed by Erudite to speed healing. What amazing technology, if only they used it to fix up their banged up city. They go to the cafeteria and meet the abnegation who escaped. One of the abnegation puts a cup of steaming liquid under my nose and says, drink this, it will help you sleep as it helps some of the others sleep. No dreams. That is well sus, mate. Have you never heard of stranger danger? You can't be taking weird drugs off of people you don't know. I only take drugs from people you do know. <laughs> anyway, she drinks it and drops dead. Chapter two. Triss wakes up. I shift and wince as something digs into my back. I reach behind me and my fingers wrap around the gun. Sleeping with a gun can't possibly be safe. What if you roll over in your sleep and accidentally shoot off one of your ass cheeks? For a moment, I see Will standing before me, both our guns between us, his hand. I could, could have shot his hand. Why didn't I? Why? And I almost scream his name. Then he's gone. I actually like this. It was heat at the moment. There was no time to stop and think. She had to shoot him to escape, otherwise she would die. But now she has survivor's guilt. I think that is realistic. Now that the adrenaline rush of yesterday is gone and whatever made me sleep has worn off, the deep ache and shooting, pul pur, shooting pains in my shoulder are intense. It's more of the same blah, 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 <laughs> yada, yada, yada language from the first book though. Shooting pains doesn't actually describe the pain she feels. She's very plain. Tobias comes in for a chat and then Triss showers. This is really a blow by blow account. This is like a diary entry. This is like in GCSE history when we learned all about World War II. We learned that, I believe it was Goebbels, was very um, regimented about his day and he'd write in his diary whenever he trimmed his moustache. This is exactly like that. The woman's bathroom is two doors down. The floor is dark brown tile. And each shower stall has wooden walls and a plastic curtain separating it from the central aisle. A sign on the back wall says, remember to conserve resources. Showers run for only five minutes. What a nightmare. Absolute dystopia. Someone knocks on the door. Beatrice? The soft voice is Susan's. <laughs> I remember who she is now, but at the time I said, who the hell is this? How should I be expected to remember a character briefly mentioned in the first book 500 pages ago? Anyway, Susan braids Triss's hair. Oh, shut up. Why did I write that? Ooh, girls night, gonna do our hair, watch mean girls, eat ice cream, talk about boys, summon a demon through an Ouija board, loves it. What? Triss chops off her hair. Caleb and Tobias dick swing over Triss, which is pretty weird considering Caleb is her brother. Spoiler alert, he's totally a traitor at the end, so why does he even give a shit here? I don't need to mention it. Anyone with eyes can see it for themselves. Caleb frowns at him. How old are you anyway? 18. And you don't think you're too old to be of my little sister? Tobias lets out a short laugh. She isn't your little anything. Why does he care? He betrays her at it. Pfft, shut up, you, you stupid boys always just trying to control women and media. So the Amity live in Fern Gully or Avatar, which was just the CGI Fern Gully or something. That fades from my mind when the crowd before me thins and I see the rest of the room. In its centre grows a huge tree. Its branches are spread over most of the greenhouse and its roots bubble up from the ground, forming a dense web of bark. 
In the spaces between the roots, I see not dirt, but water and metal rods holding the roots in place. I should not be surprised. The Amity spend their lives accomplishing feats of agriculture like this one with the help of erudite technology. Standing on a cluster of roots is Joanna Re Ray's her hair falling over the scarred half of her face. I learned in faction history, <laughs> Hogwarts of history, it ain't, that the Amity recognise no official leader. They vote on everything and the result is usually close to unanimous. They are like many parts of a single mind and Joanna is their mouthpiece. So they're like ants, basically. The Amity are all chatterboxes trying to work out an agreement on the current situation. What? He laughs a little. They each have an equal role in government. They each feel equally responsible and it makes them care. It makes them kind. I think that's beautiful. I think it's unsustainable, I say. Sure, it works for the Amity, but what happens when not everyone wants to strum banjos and grow crops? What happens when someone does something terrible and talking about can't solve the problem? What cutting political dialogue this is. What on earth is going on in the House of Commons? Joanna decides to establish the faction headquarters as a safe house for any faction member. As long as no weapons are kept and no serious conflict happens and everyone must contribute by working. I think of the gun I hid under my mattress and the tension between me and Peter and Tobias and Marcus and my mouth feels dry. I'm not good at avoiding conflict. I would have argued with Joanna, even if she'd agreed with me, and I'd have been kicked out immediately. Chapter three. Triss is getting PTSD from touching her gun, so she goes to eavesdrop on Joanna and Marcus instead. I see a flicker of movement in my periphery and look out the window that faces the apple orchard. Orchard? Orchard? Joanna Rays and Marcus Eaton walk side by side, pausing at the herb garden to pluck mint leaves from their stems. I'm out of my room before I can evaluate why I want to follow them, because it's convenient for the plot. No, Marcus cuts her off. The information is far more important than you can imagine. Most of the leaders of the city risked their lives to protect it from Janine and died, and I will not jeopardise it now for the sake of sating your selfish curiosity. I'm sorry, says Joanna. I must have done something to make you believe I am not trustworthy. The last time I trusted a faction representative with this information, all my friends were murdered, he replies. I don't trust anyone anymore. That is a reasonable enough paranoia to have. The revelations of the past half hour buzz in my mind. I thought Janine attacked the abnegation to seize power, but she attacked them to steal information, information only they knew. Then the buzzing stops as I remember something else Marcus said. Most of the leaders of the city risked their lives for it. Was one of those leaders my father? I have to know. I have to find out what could possibly be important enough for the abnegation to die for, and the erudite to kill for. Prepare to be bitterly disappointed. Back at the room, Caleb and Tobias are throwing knives at cheese. This is what happens when you don't invent television. Caleb wanted to do the big brother talk to Tobias. That flies out the window later on when he's talking to Trish, but oh well, that's what... So me and past me, we agree on a lot of things. Triss and Tobias snog for a bit until Triss tells Four what she overheard, but he doesn't believe Marcus has anything important. Triss, however, decides to follow her gut. Chapter four. Why are these chapters so short? There's 47 chapters in this book. Maybe if they weren't all two pages long, there wouldn't be 47 of them. Brilliant. Triss is talking to Caleb. So Erudite and Amity work together then, I say. More closely than Erudite and any other faction, he says. Don't you remember from our faction history book? I already said this. It's giving Hermione saying, haven't you read Hogwarts a history a million times? I could easily play Emma Watson. But Harry, <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was really sharp actually, that's horrible. But I'm Hermione Granger and you are? Mm, no, River Grin don't do that. He's just like, mm, really. mm, pleasure. <laughs> Not me picking a fight with beloved national treasure, Emma Watson. <laughs> Leave me outside, Emma. That is how she acts. Leave me alone. <laughs> Saying leave me alone to nothing as I start fights with A-list celebrities. They talk about Triss's aptitude test results. Three factions, his eyebrows lift. Yes, why? It just seems like a lot, he says. We each had to choose a research focus in erudite initiation, and mine was the aptitude test simulation, so I know a lot about the way it's designed. It's really difficult for a person to get two results. The program actually doesn't allow it, but to get three, I'm not even sure how that's possible. Not like the other girls. Tobias appears. In their enthusiasm for conflict resolution, the Amity have apparently forgotten that meddling creates more conflict, says Tobias. If we stay here much longer, I'm going to punch someone and it's not going to be pretty. Caleb and Susan both raise their eyebrows at them. Not me trying to not laugh at the joke that I wrote. A few of the Amity at the table next to us stop talking to stare. You heard me, Tobias says to them. They all look away. Calm down, Phil Mitchell. I, 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 uh. 
Marcus appears. What do you want, I say. Beatrice, Susan says quietly. There's no need. Shut up, hippie. Marcus wants to return to the city and requests Triss to escort him and the other abnegations. Tobias agrees for them to leave the day after tomorrow. And guess what? Chapter five. It's been five chapters and a single day has passed. This is almost as bad as the house of night. Triss follows Marcus again. The girl is obsessed and confronts him about his conversation with Joanna. My father. <laughs> Just wait until my father hears about this. Oh no, no, not that. My father is dead. Sorry, Triss, I forgot. R.I.P. It's the first time I've said it since I told Tobias on the train ride over that my parents died for me. Died was just a fact to me then, detached from emotion, but dead, mingling with the churning and bubbling noises in this room, strikes a blow like a hammer to my chest, and the monster of grief awakens, clawing at my eyes and throat. I wonder what Roth is like outside of Divergent. Maybe I should read her more recent work, because she says things sometimes, and I think, decent. No, it's just ruined by these boring stories. I could help you, I say. Marcus's upper lip curls. You have no idea how ridiculous that sounds. He spits the words at me. You may have succeeded in shutting down this attack simulation, girl, but it was by luck alone, not skill. I would die of shock. Good. Go ahead. If you manage to do anything useful again for a long time. What an ungrateful git. Triss stomps off, full asleep, dreams of Will, goes to Tobias's room. I shake my head. I can't tell him that I'm having nightmares about Will, or I would have to explain why. What would he think of me if he knew what I've done? How would he look at me? Fuck around and find out. Just tell him. They start snogging again. I know that I am bird. <laughs> Do you know who else calls themselves bird-like? Angela from The Office. She's like, I eat like a little bird or a squirrel. Tee hee, because I'm so tiny. And, and I just like survive off a few acorns a day. <clears throat> Made narrow and small as if for taking flights. Built straight-waisted and fragile. Of course, of course she is. She's just a precious small little baby. <laughs> I wrap my arm around his waist and take a deep breath of his shoulder. He smells like sweat. <laughs> That's literally not even funny. I don't know why I'm laughing. And fresh air and mint from the salve he sometimes uses to relax his sore muscles. He's, I'm crying. I don't know why. He smells safe too. Like the sunlit walks in the orchard and silent breakfasts in the dining hall. Which dining hall? A random one or the dauntless one? Because if it was dauntless, she never felt safe. In it was never quiet or silent. In I read the first book, Roth. Dauntless was just full of reckless idiots being mental and eating hamburgers all the time. Shush. Chapter six. The next day, Peter appears to talk to Triss. He turns to look at me. Lately, when he looks at me, it's without his usual malice. Instead, he just seems exhausted, his posture slouched, his wounded arm in a sling. But I am not fooled. To be fair, his whole faction turned into mindless killing machines, and he is on the run with people who rightfully hate him, so he probably is a bit tired. Peter wants to know what's on the hard drive. He's already stolen it because he is based. Give it to me, or so help me, I will kill you in your sleep. He smirks. If only you could see how ridiculous you look when you threaten people, like a little girl telling me she's going to strangle me of her jump rope. Hmm. Triss murdered one of her own best friends. Do not test her, pal. They start fighting until the Amity break them up. Tobias takes back the hard drive. Triss gets taken for a time out to a place called the Conflict Room where they make her sit down and have a cup of tea. It's the British way, in it? What are you doing? I'm making tea, he says. I don't think tea is really the solution to this. That is where you're wrong. Putting over there of a British flag yells in British. What the fuck actually is British culture and etiquette, right? It's so ingrained within us and I hate it. I had to pay a thing, right? Because my direct debit didn't work yesterday. So I rang the place, uh, blah, 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 paid it. Then they rung me back to be like, oh, sorry, there's actually a £10 late charge. And I was like, mm, internally, I'm like, Rrr. late. It was like an hour late and I had to pay 10 quid. Fine, whatever. But, you know, externally, I was like, yeah, sure, no worries, no worries. And then by the end of it, the lady was like, oh, yeah, sorry about that. Thank you very much for paying. And I said to her, thank you. Thank you for what? Fleecing 10 quid off me for no... But I said, thank you. Just just comes out subconsciously conscious whatever it's a reflective action thank you for taking 10 quid for nothing oh they inject her with a green liquid and drug her hippies love it this would be my hogwarts house i walk outside and the green on the trees seems greener so potent i can almost taste it maybe i can taste it and it is like the grass i decided to chew on when i was a child just to see what it was like i almost fall down the stairs because the swaying and burst into laughter when the grass tickles my bare what i walk towards the orchard they can't just drug someone like this surely personally i wouldn't complain if someone accidentally drugged me with some happy chemicals but still the principle of the matter. Triss sees Tobias and tries to snog him, but she he recognises she is drugged up, so he takes her to Joanna. I, 
Jana frowns at me. They must have given us too much. She's very, she's very small. They probably didn't take her height and weight into account. She is so small and precious. <laughs> the Amity make a habit of drugging people to keep the peace. Love it. When can I move there? That explains a lot. Excuse me, she says. What are you insinuating? Explains, he says, gritting his teeth. Why, under a pretense of neutrality, as a such a thing as possible, you have left us to die at the hands of the erudite. That is harder than it looks to enunciate that. She says slowly, the decision was not mine to make. If it was, perhaps we would be having a different conversation right now. Are you saying you disagree with them? I am saying, she says, that it isn't my place to disagree with my faction publicly, but I might, in the privacy of my own heart. This is why democracy is the death of society. I'm joking. Am I? I don't know. I don't know anymore. Am I being sarcastic? I don't even know anymore, man. Chapter 7. The serum wears off eventually. Why can't I fight the peace serum, I say. If my brain is weird enough to resist the simulation serum, why not this one? I don't know, really, he says. He drops next to me, down on the bed, jostling the mattress. Maybe in order to fight off a serum, you have to want to. Well, obviously I wanted to, I say, frustrated, but without conviction. Did I want to? Or was it nice to forget about anger, forget about pain, and forget about everything for a few hours? Fair enough. Triss goes to pick apples and then hears cars arriving. I grab the branch above me with both hands but pull myself up with only my left arm. I'm surprised I'm still able to do that. She spends a month with Dauntless being beaten up, somehow has this incredible physical strength in both arms. You're okay, Roth. Triss climbs the tree to spy on the erudite cars. I wanted to mention this earlier but I didn't think I had enough examples at the time but Triss is always conveniently spying on or eavesdropping on people to move the plot forward in both books so far. I don't think eavesdropping is as common or as subtle as Roth, Roth thinks. Confound it all, Samwise Ganji! Have you been eavesdropping? I haven't been dropping no eaves, sir, honest. Triss runs back to the cafeteria and tells the gang that the erudite are here. Why do we need to run, says Susan. The Amity established this place as a safe house, no conflict allowed. Be quiet, you naive, annoying child. Triss goes to get her gun and destroys the hard drive in case the erudite catch them. They disguise themselves as Amity. I pull pins from Susan's hair. The hairstyle is too severe for Amity. She gives me a small grateful smile as her hair falls on her shoulders. The first time I've ever seen it that way. It softens her square jaw. Triss is actually really, ne she's such a neggy person. She's so backhanded. It softens her square jaw. Uh, Joanna would be pretty if it wasn't for that big scar disfiguring her. Um, who's the other one? Janine. Uh, she's fat around the middle. <laughs> Shut up. There are some dauntless traitors with the erudite. They blend in with the amity, not the traitors, the whatever, the refugees. Joanna comes in and says that the abnegation refugees have moved on. Not for the first time in my life, I'm glad that I'm small and plain. Where I'm so small and plain, I baby. <laughs> An erudite is suspicious of Tobias, so he pulls he pulls her over. Guns go off. Triss has PTSD or shooting will. It all kicks off, but they escape. Triss saves Peter's life again. They run for a field like Theresa May. What kind of reference is that? She did she actually. The erudite shoot at the, my spelling's awful, Banigation. Nameless abnegation died, but they are nameless and faceless, so I don't really care. Thank God the toxicity of four has begun. Tobias turns towards me. What was that, Triss? He says. What, I say, and I am ashamed of how weak my voice sounds. Can I just please stop fidgeting? More than five seconds, can I just not fidget with something? It's annoying. I don't know whether he's talking about Peter or what came before or something else. You froze. Someone was about to kill you and you just sat there. He is yelling now. I thought I could rely on you to at least save your own life. Yep. They all just survived death again with people who are already traumatised. So better start yelling my feelings because that'll help things. That'll fix stuff, won't it? He's an idiot. Chapter 8. They head to the city. Don't know why. They jump onto the train and are confronted by the factionless led by former Dauntless initiate Eric. Nope. Edward. Please, says Susan, her lip wobbling, her eyes fill with tears. We've been running and the rest of them are dead and I don't... She starts to sob again. I don't think I can keep going. I... I get the strange urge to hit my head against the wall. Other people's sobs make me uncomfortable. It's selfish of me, maybe. No, you're just emotionally immature, but then again, you are 16, so... Swings and roundabouts. Yeah, Edward tilts his head. What have you ever done for us? I helped you when no one else would, I say, remember? Yeah, maybe. But the others? Says Edward. Not so much. Tobias steps forward, so Edward's gun is almost against his throat. My name is Tobias Eaton, Tobias says. I don't think you want to push me off this train. 
The effect of the name on the people in the car is immediate and bewildering. They lower their weapons. They exchange meaningful looks. I remember this. This is such a Mary Sue trait to have, to be the son or the daughter of somebody important. Like the main character is secretly a princess or heir to this great treasure or throne or whatever. In this case, Triss is the daughter of a special, important, genetically pure person from outside the city for the social experiment going on inside. You don't know that yet though, spoiler alert. And Tobias's mother is actually leader of the factionless because she, they faked her death. Tobias and I sit on the edge of the car with our legs dangling over the edge. I mean, I'd assume so. Word proximity, edge two times one go. Do you know who it is? Tobias nods. Who them? It's hard to explain, he says. I have a lot to tell you. I lean against him. Yeah, I say. So do I. I don't know how much time passes before they tell us to get off. Do you know what they could have spent that train ride doing? Instead of sitting there in silence, actually talking to one another and getting to know each other, but I guess not. They get to a factionless headquarters, which is more of a storehouse. We walk into a dark hallway. I feel at home, in the dark and the quiet that are like the tunnels in the Dauntless headquarters. Tobias, however, winds a loose thread from his shirt around his finger, backward and forward, over and over. He knows who we're meeting, but I still have no idea. How is it I know this little about the boy who says he loves me? The boy whose real name is powerful enough to keep us alive in a train car full of enemies. Because it's lust, not love. The door opens and a severe looking woman with a lazy eye, st there we go again, just dabbing on people, <laughs> stands in the doorway. Her steady eye scans the four of us. Strays, she says. Not hardly, Therese. So may. He jabs his thumb over his shoulder at Tobias. This one's Tobias, eat him. Therese stares at Tobias for a few seconds and then nods. He certainly is. Hold on. She shuts the door again. Tobias swallows hard. It's Adam Apple's... It's Adam's apple bobbing. You know who she's going to get, don't you? Says Caleb to Tobias. Caleb, Tobias says, please shut up. To my surprise, my brother suppresses his erudite curiosity. Erudite curiosity, more like Captain Obvious. No shit, Sherlock. Of course he knows who they're going to get, dumb dumb. Wow, did you have to have a genius IQ to figure that one out? A middle-aged woman stands behind the table. She has curly black hair and olive skin. Her features are stern, so angular that they almost make her unattractive, but not quite. Again. The woman is called Evelyn and is actually Tobias's mum. You really don't get it, he says. You don't have the vaguest conception of what you've done to me, he sounds breathless. I don't want to join up with your little band of factionless. I just want to get out of here as quickly as possible. My little band of factionless is twice the size of Dauntless, says Evelyn. You would do well to take it seriously. Its actions may determine the future of this city. With that, she walks ahead of him and ahead of me. Her words echo in my mind, twice the size of Dauntless. When do they become so large? Probably because every single year people fail initiations and get kicked to the curb and made fat. Look, duh, are you stupid? How does she have an affinity for erudite? Shut up. Evelyn had an affair on Marcus and faked her death to leave abnegation, but didn't take Tobias with her, so Tobias hates her for it. Each chapter, I've worked this out because there's like 554 pages or, or something like that, or 34. Each chapter is on average 11 pages long. Chapter nine. One of the factionless started a fire so we could heat up our food. Those who want to eat sit in a circle around the large metal bowl that contains the fire, first heating the cans, then passing out spoons and forks, then passing cans around so everyone can have a bite of everything. I try to think about how many diseases could spread this way as I dip my spoon into a can of soup. Quick, everyone wash your hands while singing happy birthday twice. Only British people will get that reference. Most of the factionless are dauntless because of their shite initiation. Yeah, well, you've got one of the worst initiations. And then there's that whole old age thing. Old age thing, I say. I glance at Tobias. He is listening now and he looks almost normal again. His eyes thoughtful and dark in the firelight. Once the dauntless reach a certain level of physical deter... deter <laughs> I can say that. Deterioration. De deter... Sharp. He says... They are asked to leave in one way or another. What's the other way? My heart pounds like it already knows an answer I can't face without prompting. Let's just say, says Tobias, that for some, death is preferable to factionlessness. It's like Logan's run, but not as good. Those people are idiots, says Edward. I'd rather be factionless than dauntless. How fortunate that you ended up where you did then, said Tobias coldly. Fortunate, Edward snorts. Yeah, I'm so fortunate with my one eye and all. I seem to recall hearing rumours that you provoked that attack, says Tobias. What are you talking about, I say. He was winning, that's all, and Peter was jealous, so he just... I see the smirk on Edward's face and stop talking. Maybe I don't know everything about what happened during initiation. There was an inciting incident, says Edward, in which Peter did not come out the victor, but it certainly didn't war warrant a butter knife to the eye. 
No arguments here, says Tobias. If it makes you feel any better, you got shot in the arm from a foot away during the simulation attack. Tobias stands for nothing. He is wetless. This is why I don't like him. For example, just now, ooh, you provoked him. And Ed was like, yeah, didn't warrant having my eyeball literally popped. Oh, huh, yeah, I guess actually, I'm an idiot. Guess what happens next? I wake when the fire is just a glow and only a few of the faction lists are still up. It takes me a few seconds to figure out why I woke up. I heard Evelyn's and Tobias's voices a few feet away from me. I stay still and hope they don't discover that I'm awake. Triss eavesdrops again. She sighs. The Divergent. We're documenting the Divergent. How do you know who they are? Before the simulation attack, part of the abnegation aid effort involved testing the factionless for a certain genetic anomaly, she says. Sometimes that testing involved re-administering the aptitude test. Sometimes it was more complicated than that. But they explained to us that they suspected we might have the highest divergent population of any group in the city. So the outside overseers are just letting the genetically pure, her humanity's last hope and future, resting on their shoulders, divergence, be homeless. Makes sense, Roth. The factionists are planning to usurp the erudites. We don't want to be tyrants, she says. We want to establish a new society, one without factions. My mouth goes dry. No factions? A world in which no one knows who they are or where they fit? I can't even fathom it. I imagine only chaos and isolation. Yeah, because your society is clearly doing so well now. I would pick chaos with Ed Miliband, thanks. Evelyn plans to destroy Erudite somehow and then everyone goes to bed goodnight. Chapter 10. Triss goes for a shower. Hello, Susan says. I turn my head to the side. Water courses down my cheek and into my nose. She is carrying two towels, one white, one grey, both frayed at the edges. Hi, I say. I have an idea, she says. She turns her back to me and holds up a towel, blocking my view of the rest of the bathroom. I sigh with relief. Privacy, or as much of it as possible. I strip quickly and grab the bar of soap next to the sink. What a Susan that is, not Tris. Susan is going off to live with the other abnegation refugees. Evelyn shows up to shitster. It was actually, she shrugs, but I'm not fooled. She is anything but nonchalant. I was erudite for our abnegation. Oh, I say. Guess you can keep up with the life of academia then. She doesn't take the bait. Something like that, yes, she pauses. I imagine your father left for the same reason. I almost turn away to end the conversation, but her words create a kind of pressure inside my mind, like she is squeezing my brain between her hands. I stare. You didn't know? She frowns. I'm sorry. I forgot that faction members rarely discuss their old factions. What? I say, my voice cracking. Your father was born in Erudite, she says. His parents were friends with Janine Matthews' parents before they died. Your father and Janine used to play together as children. I used to watch them pass books back and forth at school. I imagine my father, a grown man, sitting next to Janine, a grown woman at a lunch table in my old cafeteria, a book between them. The idea is so ridiculous to me that I half snort, half laugh. It can't be true. Except. Except he never talked about his family or childhood. Except he did not have the quiet demeanour of someone who grew up in abnegation. Except his hatred of erudite was so vehement it must have been personal. I'm sorry, Beatrice, says Evelyn. I didn't mean to reopen closing wounds. I frown. Yes, you did. I don't remember this part, but what a twist. Is nothing what it really seems? Is no one's backstory safe? I'm not stupid, I say. I can see that you're trying to use him, and I'll tell him so if he hasn't figured it out already. My dear girl, he, she says. I am his family. I am permanent. You are only temporary. Yeah, I say. His mum abandoned him, and his dad beat him up. How could his loyalty not be with his beloved, with a family like that? This woman is setting off my fight or flight because family means nothing without love and trust. Blood don't matter unless you like the people you're related to. It don't matter. Don't let anyone trick you into thinking that. It's family above all. No, if you've been born into an abusive or just shit family, you owe them nothing. You owe them nothing. Caleb decides to stay with Susan, but Tris wants to leave for candor. Tobias emerges from the men's bathroom a few minutes later, his red empty shirt replaced by a black t-shirt and his short hair glistening with water. Our eyes meet across the room and I know it's time for time to leave. They've been there for one night. 118 pages. That many already? And the story has taken place over like three days. But it also feels rushed at the same time. I don't understand. I can't breathe. By the next sentence, they're at the Candor headquarters. What is going on? Dawn, I didn't know that they unlocked fast travelling. Dauntless are at the Candor headquarters. Thank you. Past me. Already said that. Identify yourselves, she says. She is young, but not young enough to know Tobias. The others gather behind her. Some of them eye us with suspicion, the rest with curiosity. But far stranger than both is the light I see in some of their eyes. Recognition. They might know Tobias, but how could they possibly recognise me? Because you were the first jumper and you're that special, remember? XXX. They get arrested. Chapter 11. Triss and Four are locked in a room together. His eyes should be wild of apprehension given where we are, but they are still in dark. They transport me to familiar places. 
safe places where confessing that I shot to one of my best friends would be easy, where I would not be afraid of the way that Tobias will look at me when he finds out what I did. Tobias, of all people, wouldn't judge this because he is so smart and brooding and mysterious and he probably doesn't even remember Will anyway. Like, did they even say a sentence to each other? Some people enter, including the representative of Candor. Candor. By most faction standards, he is a young leader, only 39 years old. But by Dauntless standards, that's nothing. Eric became a Dauntless leader at 17. But that's probably one of the reasons the other factions don't take our opinions or decisions seriously. Ha! Burn. What are we accused of? I interrupt him. He is accused of crimes against humanity. You are accused of being his accomplice. This series is a crime against humanity. The Candor saw video footage of the attack and saw Tobias running the simulation. They try to argue, but Jack says that they will be injected. Did I even say like his name was, I didn't even say that, like his name is Jack Kang. I didn't even say that, I'm stupid. Jack Kang says that they will be injected with truth serum instead, which is a fantastic idea. How would most crime exist if people knew that they were going to be caught out through one administering dose of truth serum? I look older. Well, I don't even know if crime does exist in this world because there's very little world building. I look older. Maybe it's the short hair or maybe it's that I wear all of this that has happened like a mask. Either way, I always thought I would be happy when I stopped looking like a child, but all I feel is a lump in my throat. I'm no longer the daughter my parents knew. They will never know me as I am now. I quite like some of Roth's writing sprinkled throughout this story. I do. Triss and Four hang around doing nothing until the serum trial, but Christina appears to hug Triss. She doesn't look like the Christina I remember. Her hair is shorter, like a boy's. Cancelled. Hair don't have gender. <laughs> I tried to smile back, but I'm too nervous. Christina will be there at my interrogation. She will hear what I did to Will. She will never forgive me. Eh, uh, she knew him a month. She'll get over it. The other Dauntless are fine, except Yuria's brother, Zeki, Zeki, whatever, who is a traitor. I barely know him, so I don't care. I'm sure he has his reasons. They get to the interrogation room and Tobias goes first. Niles opens the black box. It contains two needles, one for Tobias and one for me. He takes an antiseptic wipe from his pocket and offers it to Tobias. We didn't bother with that kind of thing in Dauntless. Yes, because risking infection is very brave indeed. I bet Dauntless don't use condoms either. Tobias gets injected. Chapter 12. What are the names of your parents, Tobias? Tobias opens his mouth to answer and then clenches his jaw as if to stop the words from spilling out. Why is this relevant? Tobias asks. The candle around me mutter to each other, some of them scowling. I raise my eyebrow at Christina. It's extremely difficult not to immediately answer questions while under truth serum, she says. It means he has a seriously strong will and something to hide. So strong, so broody, so mysterious. But everyone recognises Marcus's surname. I can tell by the clamour that rises in the room after Tobias speaks. The candor all know Marcus is the most influential government official, and some of them must have read the article Janine released about his cruelty to his son. It was one of the only things she said that was true, and now everyone knows that Tobias is that son. Tobias Eaton is a powerful name. Roth, I don't care. I'm not impressed by Tobias. Stop trying to make me like, tr stop trying to make four happen. Tobias admits that he transferred to escape Marcus and that he is divergent. So the first serum didn't work on him during the abnegation attack. Christina asks Triss if she is too. It's like her eyes swirl to fill their sockets. That's how big they get. I have trouble identifying her expression. Is it shock? Fear? Or? Do you know what it means? I say. I heard about it when I was young, she says in a reverent whisper. Definitely or. Like it was a fantasy story, she says. There are people with special powers among us, like that. What a special power being a normal fucking human being. When a simulation is running, your eyes still see and process the actual world, but your brain no longer comprehends them. On some level though, your brain still knows what you're seeing and where you are. The nature of this new simulation was that it recorded my emotional responses to outside stimuli, Tobias says, closing his eyes for a few seconds, and responded by altering the appearance of that stimuli. The simulation made my enemies into friends, my friends into enemies. I thought I was shutting the simulation down, Really, I was receiving instructions about how to keep it running. Christina nods along to his words. I feel calmer when I see that most of the crowd is doing the same. This is the benefit of the truth serum, I realise. Tobias's testimony is irrefutable this way. I quite like this because a trope that I can't stand in media is when a misunderstanding carries the plot the whole way through. Something that can easily be explained away if people are just honest with each other and this has completely subverted that so I appreciate it. Thank you Roth. Thank you. Very cool. Choosing Dauntless in order to escape my father was an act of cowardice, he says. I regret that cowardice. It means I am not worthy of my faction. I will always regret it. I expect the Dauntless to let out indignant shouts, maybe charge, maybe to charge the chair and beat him to a pulp. Good. Grow up. They are capable of far more erratic things than that, but they don't. They stand in stony silence with stony faces staring at the young man who did not betray them but never truly felt that he belonged to them. The Dauntless are children if that is what Triss expected from them. Thank you for your honesty, they whisper. I don't join him. I am the only thing that 
kept him in the faction he wanted to leave. I'm not worth that. Maybe he deserves to know. Grow up, you 16 year old who is also under immense stress. Now it's Triss's turn. I wasn't good enough for abnegation, I say, and I wanted to be free, so I chose Dauntless. Why weren't you good enough? Because I was selfish, I say. You were selfish? You aren't anymore? Of course I am. My mother said that everyone is selfish, I say, but I became less selfish and Dauntless. I discovered there were people I would fight for, die for even, it knows these people for a month. Also, is this a truth, like, court case, or is this therapy? I know what comes next. My mother died and then I killed Will. I shot him, I killed him. She distracted the Dauntless soldiers so I could get away and they killed her, I say. Some of them ran after me and I killed them. But there are Dauntless in the crowd around me. Dauntless. I killed some of the Dauntless. I shouldn't talk about it here. I kept running, I say, and, and Will ran after me and I killed him. No, no, I feel sweat near my hairline. And I found my brother and father, I say, my voice strained. We formed a plan to destroy the simulation. Of course she can fight back and trick the truth serum, of course she can. Just to clarify, says Niles, are you telling me that you were almost murdered by the erudite and then fought your way into the Dauntless compound and destroyed the simulation? Yes, I say. I think I speak for everyone, he says, when I say that you have earned the title of Dauntless. Shouts <laughs> rise up from the left side of the room and I see blurs of fists pressing into the dark air, my faction calling to me. Typical Yanks, always cheering and whooping and hollering. Puh. Triss chooses to admit to killing Will. And there is something else, something worse than I didn't realise before. I was willing to die rather than kill Tobias, but the thought never occurred to me when it came to Will. I decided to kill Will in a fraction of a second. She had a fraction of a second to decide what to do about Will, and Will doesn't love her, so he would have killed her. I'll, I'll forgive her. I'm going to forgive her for this. Not the arsehole, get a divorce. Thank you for your honesty, they say. But Christina and Tobias say nothing. Tobias didn't even know Wills. He can get lost. Chapter 13. Christina, I say. But the only words I can think of, I'm sorry, sound more like an insult than an apology. Sorry is what you are when you bump someone with your elbow. What you are when you interrupt someone. I'm more than sorry. He had a gun, I say. He was about to shoot me. He was under the simulation. You killed him, she says. Her words sound bigger than words usually do. Like they expanded in her mouth before she spoke them. She looks at me as if she doesn't recognise me for a few seconds and then turns away. Oh well, Tobias stands next to me. I brace myself for his reaction. I got our weapons back, he says, offering me my knife. I shove it in my back pocket without meeting his eyes. We can talk about it tomorrow, he says. Quietly. Quiet is dangerous with Tobias. Tobias can do one. She is literally under enough stress as it is. Go away. Everyone goes to sleep, but Triss walks up the floors of stairs. Stairmaster Triss thinks about what she has done and then she chucks a chair out of a window. WWE Triss. She considers jumping but decides against it. When she gets back, Tobias is up and ready to be a toxic shit. Is he? Or am I just exaggerating because I don't really like him? Mm. You didn't tell me, he says. Why not? Because I didn't. I shake my head. I didn't know how to. He scowls. It's pretty easy, Triss. This is rich coming from, from me? Why am I about to dab on myself? How dare you? This is rich coming from me. So rich it's like Elon Musk just PayPal'd me his net worth. But has anyone told Tobias that constantly reacting angrily to anything is not a personality trait? The sheer irony in me just reacting angrily to past me, calling future me. Oh, you can't make that shit up. You cannot script that. Tobias wants her to trust him more. Other things seem stranger, I say, trying to make my voice light. Like finding out that your boyfriend's supposedly dead mother is still alive by seeing her in person. Or overhearing his plans to ally with the factionless but he never tells you about it. That seems a little strange to me. He takes his hand from my shoulder. Don't pretend this is only my problem, I say. If I don't trust you, you don't trust me either. I thought we would get to those things eventually, he says. Do I have to tell you everything right away? What a filthy fucking hypocrite. That's, I don't like him. Don't try and make me like him, Roth. What a little hypocrite. She don't need to tell you. And, 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 oh, so angry. <laughs> the irony again it is it, probably way harder to say I had to kill one of my closest friends because they were going to kill me over oh am I ally with the faction list harder not shut up you mug I did tell you about Will I say that wasn't true serum it was me I said it because I chose to what are you talking about I was aware under the serum I could have lied I could have kept it from you but I didn't because I thought you deserved to know the truth. What a way to tell me, he says, scowling. In front of over a hundred people, how intimate. Hey, asshole, how about don't move goalposts? How about don't punish people for the behavior that you want to see? It's like, what I mean by this is, say you have a teenager who's very antisocial, uh, stays in every meal time, doesn't like coming down to dinner. 
But when they finally do decide to come out of their room because they decide they want to hang out with their family, their family turns around and makes shitty little like passive aggressive remarks like, oh, you finally decided to join us, blah, blah, blah. This might be relatable for a lot of you. That is what I mean. Don't punish people for the behavior you want to see from them in the first place. Like she told him in front of a hundred, don't matter. He still knows the truth. Shut up. I hate you. To bias. I'm sorry, I say, all my anger gone. I should have been honest with you. That's it? That's all you have to say? He frowns. What else do you want me to say? He shakes his head. Nothing, Triss. Nothing. I watch him walk away. I feel like a space has opened up within me, expanding so rapidly it will break me apart. What is his damage? I don't even actually know why he's mad. I can't remember why he's Why is he mad? Chapter 14. A dauntless called Lynn comes along to tell Triss to grow up. <laughs> based. You're ridiculous is what you are, she sighs. Get your stuff together. You're dauntless and it's time you acted like it. You're giving us a bad reputation among the candor. How exactly am I doing that? By acting like you don't know us. I'm just doing Christina a favour. Christina, Lynn snorts. She's a lovesick puppy. People die. That's what happens in war. She'll figure it out eventually. Yeah, people die, but it's not always your good friend who kills them. Whatever, Lynn sighs impatiently. Come on. Why is Will one of her best mates, but Lynn here is just like a good friend? To whatever. I love her new favourite character, the irony, because by the end of this book, I'm like, who the hell even is Lynn? <laughs> Lynn takes her to the Dauntless Dawn where she sees the gang. Some of us are going to the Hancock building tonight, says Uria. You should all come. We're leaving at 10. Is it planning? Says Lynn. No, surveillance. We've heard the Erudite keep their lights on all night. That is not good for the environment, is it? Which will make it easier to look through their windows, see what they're doing. I say here, why does this plan seem so childish? But right at the end, where they literally like go, go through a window by, by like cartoonishly putting the, a ladder from one to... That was childish. All of these plans seem to... Like, maybe because they are children. Oh, my God. I'm working at such vapid speed at the moment. Rapid, not va Rapid and vapid, let's be real. Her eyes fix on mine. I never noticed before how strange they are. A golden brown. And now that her hair has grown in somewhat, her boldness isn't the first that... Who is she talking about? Her boldness isn't the first thing I see. I also notice her delicate nose, her full lips. She is striking without trying to be. I'm envious of her for a moment and I think she must hate it and that's why she shaved her head. Stop gawking. Have you considered being just a normal human being? Stop staring. Tobias appears for no good reason. As always. I'll see you later, he mutters. Don't do anything stupid. Thanks for the vote of confidence, I say frowning. I didn't mean that, he says. I meant don't let anyone else do anything stupid. They'll listen to you. He leans toward me like he's going to kiss me, then seems to think better of it and leans back, biting his lip. It's a small act, but it still feels like rejection. I avoid his eyes and run out a limb. Triss could easily get captured and killed from this stupid plan, so grow up, you're in a war. Get over it. Kiss her. Traitor Dauntless appear and begin shooting the place up and Trish gets shot. Chapter 15. Triss is alive, but cylinders release smoke into the room. Everyone but Triss is knocked out, so she pretends to be unconscious too. Eric is there and then he disappears. Triss disguises herself as a dauntless traitor. Yuri is fine because he is also divergent. I sprint towards the stairwell and he follows me. As soon as my foot touches the first stair, I wonder what on earth I intend to do. There are bound to be more divergent in this building, but will they know what they are? Will they know to hide? And what do I expect to gain from submerging myself in an army of dauntless tra tra traitors, not Pokemon trainers? Deep inside me, I know the answer. I am being reckless. I'll probably gain nothing. I will probably die. And more disturbing still, I don't really care. She has truly become dauntless. Triss thinks of nursery rhymes. She stomps on unconscious people to try to find the divergence to save them. She saves one but gets caught by Eric. I was surprised to discover you were still alive, he says, considering I'm the one who told Janine to construct that water tank just for you. She thought studying one of the divergence reaction to a real life version of a simulation would be fascinating, he says, and he presses me forward so I have to walk. His breath tickles my hair. And I agree. You see, ingenuity, one of the qualities we value most in Erudite, requires creativity. Pointless theatrics that ended up costing them the, f the simulation so they're not so bright are they? Triss kicks him in the balls but he still doesn't let go of her. He brings her to the other captured divergence including Yuria. Triss has a hidden knife. Cliffhanger. Chapter 16. Triss decides to stab Eric but waits for the right moment. Eric straight up shoots and murders an 11 year old boy for the bants, for the shits and gigs mate. Most of the diversion get two results in the aptitude test, some only get one. No one has ever gotten free, not because of aptitude, but simply because in order to get that result, you have to refuse to choose something. She's just that special. My superiors suspect that you've got two, Triss, he says. They don't think you're that complex, just an even blend of abnegation and dauntless, selfless to the point of idiocy. Or is that brave to the point of idiocy? Or is it just plain old idiocy? Triss stabs him and the Divergent overpowers the boneheaded dauntless traitors because they weren't armed with real guns. Tobias appears out of nowhere. Why is he always doing that? It's creepy. The dauntless traitors sprint away from the elevator bank. 
They were not prepared for an attack, not from all sides. Some of them fight back, but most run for the stairs. Tobias fires over and over again until his guns run out of bullets and the trigger makes a clicking sound as said. My vision is too blurry with tears and my hands too useless to fire a gun. I scream into gritted teeth, frustrated. I can't help. I am worthless. Trius really needs to see a therapist to work on that self-esteem of hers. I'll give you my therapist number if you really need. B. She's not worthless. Thanks to her, Eric got incapacitated in the first but Thanks to her. Chapter 17. One erudite helped evacuate loyal Dauntless, who in turn overpowered the Dauntless traitors. And who was that erudite woman? Albert Einstein. No, Will's sister. Trius has been injected with a metal disc at some point during the kerfuffle. I missed that bit. She removes it but notes that she's been injected with something blue. Ah, oh, something boris, something blue. How nice. Uriel looks better than he does. At... What? Shut up, read properly. Uriel looks better than he did an hour ago. He washed the blood from his mouth and some of the colour has returned to his face. I'm struck, suddenly, by how handsome he is. All his features are proportionate. <laughs> oh, good for him. His eyes dark and lively, his skin bronze brown, and he has probably always been that handsome. Only boys who have been that handsome from a young age have that arrogance in their smile. Why don't you just marry him then? I don't get why they have it out for us. I mean, when they were trying to mind control themselves in army, sure, but now? Seems useless. I frown as I press a clean paper towel to my shoulder to stop the bleeding. He's right. Janine always, already has an army, so why kill the Divergent now? Who knows? In the morning, I run out of needles to remove. Rec room for a dream moment. Caleb runs up to me and folds me carefully into his arms. I breathe a sigh of relief. I thought I had gotten to the point where I didn't need my brother anymore. Ha. But I don't think such a point actually exists. I relax against him for a moment and catch Tobias' eye over Caleb's shoulder. Why is this specified? Is Tobias going to get jealous of Triss's brother now or something? Marcus and Peter are still alive, but Peter is with the erudite because he is based. All right, Caleb squeezes my arm and walks off, probably to get in the miles-long cafeteria line. Tobias and I stand yards away from each other for a few seconds. He approaches me slowly. You okay? He says. I might throw up if I have to answer that one more time, I say. I don't have a bullet in my head, do I? So I'm good. Your jaw is so swollen, you look like you have a wad of food in your cheek and you just stabbed Eric, he said, frowning. I'm not allowed to ask if you're okay. Sharp, idiot. Save the relationship drama for another time. He nods and we leave the cafeteria. One the dauntless we pass yells, Oh look, it's Tobias Eaton. I had almost forgotten about the interrogation and the name it revealed to all of the dauntless. Another one yells, I saw your daddy here earlier, Eaton. Are you going to go hide? Tobias straightens and stiffens like someone is training a gun at his chest instead of jeering at him. Yeah, are you going to hide? Coward. Pointless time to be divisive. But okay, idiots. They go off to talk about serums and transmitters and blah, 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 blah. They've developed a long-lasting transmitter, I say. He nods. So now we're all wired for multiple simulations, I add. As many as Janine wants, maybe. He nods again. My next breath shakes on the way out of my mouth. This is really bad, Tobias. Snore. One thing I don't understand, he says. You were downstairs. You could have just run away. But instead you decided to dive into a crowd of armed dauntless and bite all by yourself. And I'm willing to bet you weren't carrying a gun. I press my lips together. Which is odd, considering you are acting like a psychopath, he says. It's not brave, choosing the position you were in yesterday. It's beyond stupid. It's suicidal. Don't you have any regard for your own life? Of course I do, I retort. I was just trying to do something useful. This is all she does for the rest of the series. Even after a point in this where she's like, no, I want to live and I want to live my life and honour my parents, she's still like, this is all she does. And it's a bit irritating. You're more than dauntless, he says in a low voice. But if you want to be just like them, hurling yourself into ridiculous situations for no reason and retaliating against your enemies without any regard for what's ethical, go right ahead. I thought you were better than that, but maybe I was wrong. Four is high-key irritating. Like, Tris, low-key irritating. Four, high-key irritating. Give it a break, mate. Just She is stressed out. She's got PTSD. Stop going on at her every five bloody minutes. Hate him. Dump him. Dump him, babes. In the cafeteria, all the gang is there having banter, but Kara, Will's sister, walks in. I can't go back to Erudite any more than they can, says Caleb. When this is over, I won't have a faction. I'm aged poorly. Tris falls asleep on the table in the cafeteria. Just quirky girl things, I guess. Chapter 18. Jack Kang is giving a meeting. What well, seems to me to require more investigation, Jack says, is the Divergent. Ah, yes, the old, let's ignore the attackers and focus on why, really, the victims are at fault for all of this. It seems clear to me, says Jack, that we were attacked so the Erudite could find the Divergent. Do you know why that is? See? So predictable. I'm always right. Let's blame the victims instead of the people going around doing the murders. Apparently, Marcus is divergent too. 
No, I do not, says Marcus. Perhaps their intention was merely to identify us. It seems like useful information to have if they intend to use their simulations again. That was not their intention. The words have passed my lips before I decide to speak them. But my voice sounds high and weak compared to Marcus's and Jack's, but it's too late to stop us. They wanted to kill us. They've been killing us since before any of this happened. That sounds very much like a conspiracy theory, Jack says. What reason would the erudite have to kill you? How is it a conspiracy theory when Eric was about to have them all shot on the roof? Roth, this forced melodrama makes zero sense when this faction has Veritas Serum. Veritas Serum. Veritas Serum. The, the Harry Potter thing, well, right? It's a Harry Potter reference. Obviously, we don't know, he says, but there are nearly a dozen mysterious deaths re recorded among the Dauntless from the past six years, and there is a correlation between those people and irregular aptitude test results or initiation simulation results. Lightning strikes, making the room glow. Jack shakes his head. While that is intriguing, correlation does not constitute er evidence. A dauntless leader shot a candor child in the head, I snap. Did you get a report of that? Did it seem worthy of investigation? Jack Kang is being a complete moron on purpose and it's kind of bad writing because it, it's just, it's forced. It's a forced problem. He is the leader of the candor. They have the truth serum stuff. The candor, like, they have a, they have a quest for truth over everything else. He should... What happened? I give up. I'm not arguing. Their peaceful invasion suggests to me that it may be possible to negotiate a peace treaty with the erudite and naval dauntless, he continues. So I will arrange a meeting with Janine Matthews to discuss that possibility as soon as possible. This is just rage bait. It's just, it's just meant to make you, the audience, mad that he's being so boneheaded. Their invasion wasn't peaceful, I say. I can see the corners of Tobias's mouth from where I stand and he is smiling. I take a deep breath and begin again. Just because they didn't shoot you on the head doesn't mean their intentions were somehow honourable. Why do you think they came here? Just to run through your hallways, knock you unconscious and leave? I assume they came here for people like you, says Jack. And while I am concerned for your safety, I don't think we can attack them just because they wanted to kill a fraction of our population. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Jack Kang decides to be useless. Chapter 19. Outside, Tori and Zeki, Zeke, are among the dauntless traitors. Tori is bleeding a lot, so naturally Triss just gets herself involved, of course. Better step back, girl, the blonde dauntless man says. No, I say, put your gun down. Told you the divergent was crazy. One of the other armed dauntless mutters to the woman next to him. Oh, idiots, divisive idiots. Tori and Zeki were just being spies. We sit in a room in Candle headquarters called the Gathering Place, which the dauntless have taken to saying in a mocking way wherever they can. Literally, what? what is the joke? Uh, uh, let's go to the gathering room. I don't get it. Zeke was cleared by the candor an hour ago in a short interrogation on the 18th floor. It was not as somber an occasion as Tobias's and my interrogation, partly because there was no suspicious video footage implicating Zeki, and partly because Zeki is funny even when under truth serum. I would love to see an example of said hilarity, but alas, yeah, but we've been insulting you since the simulation attack, Lynn says, and now I feel like a jerk about it. Zeki puts his arm around Shauna. You are a jerk, Lynn. It's part of your charm. Lynn launches a plastic cup at him, which he deflects. Water sprays over the table, hitting him in the eye. Can't even just have some water without all these bozos being annoying about it. They'd be so annoying to know. Shut up. Will's sister comes in, so Trish tries to hide. Just go over to her and say, Hi. Bit awkward this, isn't it? You, me, Will, a gun. Ugh. Joking. Kara and Christina leave, so Triss follows them to eavesdrop. You, you all thought I was lying. You thought I was all, you thought I was making it up, but I do not lie to you lot. Just can't handle her being here. One of them sobs, Christina. I can't stop picturing it, what she did. I don't understand how she could have done that. Christina's sobs makes me feel like I'm about to crack open. Kara takes her time responding. Well, I do, she says. What? Christina says with a hiccup. <laughs> what? <laughs> You have to understand, we're trained to see things as logically as possible, says Kara. So don't think that I'm callous. But that girl was probably scared out of her mind, certainly not capable of assessing situations cleverly at the time, if she ever was able to do so. Yeah, not to be totally callous either, but Christina knew Will for all of a month, and she's there crying to his sister of his lifetime. Of all of his life. Do you know what I mean? Kara continues. Anyway, you don't have to forgive her, but you should try to understand that what she did was not out of malice, it was out of panic. That way, you can look at her without wanting to punch her in her exceptionally long nose. My hand moves automatically towards my nose. Christina laughs a little, which feels like a hard poke to the stomach. I back up through the door to the gathering place. Even though Kara was rude and the nose comment was a low blow, I am grateful for what she said. 
See, she's not pretty. She has a long... Hey, hey, back off, back up, back off. Leave long noses alone. Tobias relays info that Kang is going to meet an erudite representative. I frown at him. How does he know all this information? And why, after two years of avoiding becoming a dauntless leader at all costs, is he suddenly acting like one? At all costs didn't include an ongoing war between the factions back then, you dolt. They all asked Triss to think like an erudite because that's um, how divergence works or something. Don't shawn on me, she says, focusing her scowl on him instead. Don't you think that someone with an aptitude for multiple factions might have a loyalty problem? If she's got aptitude for erudite, how can we be sure she's not working for erudite? How dumb are these people? Like, pretty sure out of all of them, Triss isn't secretly working for erudite. Triss, who helped stop the simulation and helped capture and stab Er- Sharp. Maybe Shauna could do with trying to think more like an erudite. I pinched the bridge of my nose. I already have a headache. Same. I think, I say, that Janine Matthews will manipulate him and that he will do anything to protect his faction, even if it means sacrificing the Divergent. I paused for a moment, remembering how he held his faction's influence over our heads at the meeting, or sacrificing the Dauntless, so we need to hear what they say in that meeting. Oh, good. More eavesdropping. Chapter 20. They sit and wait in the cafeteria. If there's a faction left after all this is over, Lynn says, piling her mashed potatoes on to a roll. Don't tell me you're going to eat a mashed potato sandwich, I say to her. So what if I am? Are you sure that this book isn't based in England? Some dauntless boys bully Tobias by whispering coward in his ear. Tobias decides to fix this issue by punching his dad in the teeth. Veneers gone. Tobias whacks his dad with his belt before Triss stops him. What, you're feeling sorry for him now? Tobias says, turning toward me with a scowl. Do you know how many times he did that to me? How do you think I learned the moves? I feel brittle, like I might break. It did seem rehearsed, like Tobias had gone over the steps in his mind, recited the words in front of a mirror. He knew it by heart. He was just playing the upper part this time. No, I say quietly. I don't feel sorry for him, not at all. Then watch Triss. His voice is rough. It could be the thing that breaks me. You haven't cared about what I do or say for the past week. What's so different about this? The melodrama, I can't take it. Triss goes back to the cafeteria to speak to Marcus. I thought we went over this. His voice is muffled by the paper towels. The idea that you could help. I don't know where you get this delusion that I'm useless, but that's what it is, I snap. And I'm not interested in hearing about it. All I want to say is that when you stop being delusional and start feeling desperate because you're too inept to figure this out on your own, you know who to come to. I leave the bathroom just as the candle man comes back with an ice pack. Face. Chapter 21. Triss has a gun and is panicking about it. I start to lift it, bringing my left hand to meet my right to steady it. I hold the gun out for my body, my arms straight, just as Paul taught me, when that was his only name. I used the gun like this to defend my father and brother from simulation bound dauntless. I used it to stop Eric from shooting Tobias in the head. It is not inherently evil, it is just the tool. I see a flicker of movement in the mirror, and before I stop myself, I stare at my reflection. This is how I looked to him, I think. This is how I looked when I shot him. Moaning like a wounded animal, I let the gun fall from my hands and wrap my arms around my stomach. I want to stop because I know it will make me feel better, but I can't force the tears to come. I just crouch in the bathroom, staring at the white tiles. I can't do it. I can't take the gun with me. It is a far cry from the Triss who first shot a gun and felt really powerful with it, so well done, Roth. Tobias comes in so that he and Triss can start arguing again about who keeps the most secrets. He crosses his arms. He is not bulky, the way some dauntless boys are, and some girls might focus on the way his ears stick out or the way his nose hooks at the... <laughs> She's so neggy. My God. But to me... Dot, dot, dot. I swallow the rest of that thought. He's here to yell at me. He's been keeping things from me. Whatever we are now, I can't indulge thoughts about how attractive he is. Roth, this is so embarrassing. My BF yells at me, but I can't notice how dreamy he is, even with his sticking out Dumbo ears. (laughs) (laughs) Me with my Pinocchio nose and him with his Dumbo ears. We're just such a little Disney romantic story. Anyway, they go to the location to spy underneath some metal mesh so Jack is standing above them. I should inform you that this will not be a negotiation, Max says. In order to negotiate, you have to be on even footing, and you, Jack, are not. What do you mean? I mean that you are the only disposable faction. Candor does not provide us with protection, sustenance, or technological innovation. Therefore, you are expendable to us, and you have not done much to win the favour of your dauntless guests, says Max. So you are completely vulnerable and completely useless. I recommend, therefore, that you do as exactly as I say. Get wrecked. Triss works out that Max is being relayed information via, like, by Janine via an earpiece, so she must be close by. As she's figuring it out, Lynn shoots Max. Everyone starts shooting each other, but Triss goes to find Janine, who is being protected by Peter. Why would a leader rely on a teenage boy? 
as a bodyguard, dauntless or not. A boy that also went from, no, what was he in the first place? Was he Candor or Erudite? So he went from Candor to Dauntless, and now he's hanging out with the Erudite. It's not Pokemon, you can't like catch all the factions. Triss retreats to go help her friends, chapter 22. Shauna, the girl who hates Triss, has been shot. Guess that gets rid of that problem then, doesn't it? They take Shauna back to the Merciless Mart. This is the, the, it's not the place from Fallout. This is what the place is called. Tobias stands in front of me, his face red with exertion. I want him to fold me into his arms again, like he did after the last attack, but he doesn't, and I know better than to initiate it. Oh good, testy Tobias is back. I'm not going to pretend to know what's going on with you, he says, but if you senselessly risk your life again, I am not senselessly risking my life. I am trying to make sacrifices like my parents would have. You are not your parents. You are a 16-year-old girl. I grip my teeth. How dare you? Who does not understand that the value of sacrifice lies in its necessity, not in throwing your life away. And if you do that, you and I are done. You know, in spirit, I agree with him, but also dump him, dump him, dump him. Always dump them. Always dump them. Tris is still <laughs> my toxic trait, just dumping everyone. Even if you're not in a relationship with me, you're still going to get dumped. Tris is talking to Tori. Tori was planning on killing Janine, but got caught. They call a meeting. Tobias decides that they should go back to Dauntless headquarters and retake it. They also decide on new leaders. A few people want Tris to take charge. Someone nominates four. Apart from a few angry murmurs in the back of the room, no one disagrees. No one is calling him a coward anymore. Not after he beat up Marcus in the cafeteria. I wonder how they would react if they knew how calculated that move was. Why does it matter if it's calculated or not? The end result is still the same. Marcus, his father, got beaten up. They would never have considered me had I not stopped the attack simulation. And maybe they wouldn't have considered me if I hadn't stabbed Eric by those elevators or put myself under that bridge. The more reckless I get, the more popular I am with the Dauntless. <clears throat> yes, that's that's how the reckless tribe works. What do you want? Tobias looks at me. I can't be popular with the Dauntless because Tobias is right. I'm not Dauntless. I'm Divergent. So is Tobias. I am whatever I choose to be. And I can't choose to be this. I have to stay separate from them. No, I say. I clear my throat and say it louder. No, you don't have to vote. I refuse my nomination. I don't understand her reason at all, but whatever. Tobias is now leader alongside Tori. Yay, snort, whatever. Vomiting, furious, crying, weeping. Chapter 23. Jack Kang announces everyone to go to the gathering place, so Dauntless prepare to leave. They are now in a semicircle around Eric. They ask Eric to list all of his crimes. Eric scans the crowd for a few seconds and his eyes settle on me. He laces his fingers and sets them gingerly on his stomach. I'd like her to list them. I'm about to have a heart attack. That's how boring this book is. I'm just trying to amuse myself. I'd like her to list them. Since she's the one who stabbed me, clearly she is familiar with them. Why is everything always about Triss? I know she's the main character, but still. Leave her out of this, Tobias says. Why? Because you're doing her? Eric smirks. Oh wait, I forgot. Stiffs don't do that sort of thing. They just tie each other's shoes and cut each other's hair. Where is the lie? Do I deserve to die, he says. Tobias opens his mouth to interrupt, but I respond before he can. Yes. Fair enough. His dark eyes are empty, like pits, like starless nights. But do you have the right to decide that, Beatrice Pryor? Like you decided the fate of that other boy? What was his name? Will? Roth clumsily tries to do an ethics on us yet again, ham-fistedly. What does that even mean? Why would you ever need a fist full of ham? Because firstly, I'm vegan, so that's offensive. Secondly, but seriously... Someone who shot a little kid point blank in the head in cold blood does not get to do an ethics on anyone else. They, they, you just don't snore. Maybe we are not the ones deciding if Eric lives or dies. Maybe he is the one who decided that when he did all of those terrible things. Quit the foreplay already and shoot him. Eric tries to taunt Tobias, but he just shoots him in the end. Chapter 24. Dauntless stampede out into Jack Kang. What? Leaving? Jack splutters. If we leave, he'll be incapable of fulfilling two of the three demands Max had of him. The thought terrifies him, and it is all over his face. I can't let you do that, he says. What would Candor do about it? Be brutally honest? Call them ugly? What? Nothing, chumps. It's almost like just relegating all positions of physical power, such as guards, bodyguards, the army, the, I'm assuming maybe the police, to one faction. Ain't gonna work out if you decide to chuck that faction in the it's almost like it's silly huh didn't you come here to find allies jack scowls if you do this we will side with erudite i promise you and you will never find an ally in us again you some allies they were they were gonna sell them out why is every leader in this book inept maybe this does say something about society after all 
Out in the hallways, Tris tells Kara to go to Amity to keep safe. In one sentence, Tris is back at the Dauntless headquarters. Somehow someone has found paintball guns to shoot all the Dauntless headquarter cameras CCTV with. Tris talks with Zeki about Shauna. Dunno. She's going to survive it, but the nurse thinks she might be paralysed from the waist down. And that wouldn't bother me, but he lifts her shoulder. How can she be Dauntless if she can't walk? Firstly, maybe it's time to rethink the arbitrary faction system. Secondly, there is loads of less able-bodied people on this earth, in this planet, who do mad shit all the time. The Paralympics are like way more physically active than I am, an able-bodied person. What excuse would Roth's characters have, especially considering their tech is way more advanced than ours, huh? How is this a stake at all? Thanks to Roth's clumsy world building, it's nonsensical. Sure she will. I look up at him. She can get a wheelchair and someone can push her up the paths in the pit and there's an elevator in the building up there. I point above our heads. She doesn't need to be able to walk to slide down the zip line or fire a gun. How, in this world full of magically advanced serums and transmitters, etc., would motorised wheelchairs or even bionic limbs not be available? What about the resources? Yeah, well, what about the resources to keep this city afloat? That never gets explained. But the, what, what's the economy? You can't have one and not the other. It's difficult to walk because it's difficult to breathe. But somehow I manage. Michael Scott, somehow I manage. Shut up. They shoot at the cameras. Would you? I lift my own gun, propping it on my left shoulder instead of my right. The gun feels unfamiliar in my left hand, but I can't bear its weight with my right yet. Through the scope, I find the camera and then squint, stare at the lens. A voice whispers in my head, inhale, aim, exhale, fire. It takes me a few seconds to realise it's Tobias's voice because he is the one who taught me to shoot. I squeeze the trigger and the paintball hits the camera, spraying blue paint across the lens. There, now you have, with the wrong hand too. Katniss spent years hunting in the woods to become a good archer with good aim. Triss gets a few lessons from Tobias. Leave me alone, Roth. And she can she can use her her her, her, her non dominant hand just fine from a few lessons with some whatever. Everyone starts having a paintball fight, abandoning their plan because they're all just so wacky and quirky and carefree. They're all they're all manic pixie dream girls of this world. By the time the fight dies down, my clothes are more paint coloured than black. I decide to keep the shirt to remind me why I chose Dauntless in the first place. Not because they are perfect, but because they are alive. Because they are free. I basically just said that. I should be the one who wrote this book. Dauntless is the manic pigs. That's what I just said. But it was written and I didn't even read that. Wow, I know I know what I think so well. Dauntless is the manic pixie dream girl who moves to a new town in an edgy indie film and she gets the main character to smoke and run around in the rain because being alive is like being rained on. It's golden and a shower. Chapter 25. I don't think that made any sense. Someone raids the Dauntless kitchens and heats up the imperishables kept there, so we have a warm dinner that night. I sit at the same table I used to claim with Christina, Alan, Will. From the moment I sit down, I feel a lump in my throat. How is it that only half of us are left? I feel responsible for that. My forgiveness could have saved Al, but I withheld it. Big deal. My clear-headedness could have spared Will, but I could not sum of it. Neither of the, the first thing, the first one definitely ain't Triss's fault, and the second one, what can you do? Even right here, I say someone called Lynn, and I put in brackets a bunch of question marks, because I was like, who the hell is Lynn? The most forgettable character by far. Lynn is mad that Yuria and Marlene fancy each other. Okay, mate. Tobias takes Triss with him on a meeting. Onto a meeting. I don't have a response to that. We ascend the stairs and cross the glass floor. On our way out, we walk through the dank room in which I face my fear landscape. Judging by the syringe on the floor, someone has been there recently. Things that sound terrible out of context. I feel a surge of hope. Maybe we won't argue this time. Maybe things will finally get better between us. We've known him a whole month, babe. The honeymoon period should at least last for six months. Just cut your losses and dump him. He brushes a stray hair away from his face and avoids my eyes. I didn't know his hair was so thick. It was hard to tell when it was buzzed short. Abnegation hair. It makes him look less threatening. More like the person I've come to know in private. Why is his hair growing so fast? It's only been a week. Do they put something in the serums? Is he taking like hair, skin and nails on the side? What? Triss injures her knee whilst jumping onto the train, which isn't something that anyone needs during a war, you muppets. Dauntless should lose by default just for being idiots. You have this entire faction of people who are reckless and do silly things, but you're in a war. Edward and Evelyn meet them. The factionless want an equal place in government after the erudite are destroyed and to destroy the erudite's data. Tobias glances at me. I wish I could tell him why I feel so conflicted. Explain to him why I, of all people, have reservations about burning erudite to the ground, so to speak. But I would not know how to say it even if I had the time to. He turns towards Evelyn. Then we are agreed, he says. He extends his hand and she shakes it. 
What was the point in Tobias bringing Tris when she said almost nothing? Evelyn reveals that Marcus had persuaded Abnegation to exile her years ago. So much for them being good loving Christians. Why did you even bring me along if you were just going to make an alliance anyway, I say flatly. Roth is listening to my thoughts. You didn't stop me. What was I supposed to do? Wave my hands in the air? I scowl at him. I don't like it. It has to be done. I don't think it does, I say. There has to be another way. What other way, he says, folding his arms. You just don't like her. You haven't since you first met her. Obviously, I don't like her. She abandoned you. They exiled her. And if I decide to forgive her, you had better try it too. I'm the one who got left behind, not you. This is about more than that. I don't trust her. I think she's trying to use you. Well, it isn't for you to decide. Why did you bring me again? I say, mirroring him by folding my arms. Oh yeah, so that I could read the situation for you. Well, I read it. Just because you don't like what I decided doesn't mean... I forgot about how your biases cloud your judgment. If I had remembered, I might not have brought you. My biases? What about your biases? What about thinking everyone who hates your father as much as you do is an ally? This is not about him. I agree with Triss. Tobias is stupid. Push him off the train. Of course it is. He knows things, Tobias, and we should be trying to find out what they are. This again? I thought we had resolved this. He's a liar, Triss. Yeah, I raise my eyebrows. Well, so is your mother. You think the abnegation would re-exile someone? Because I don't. Don't talk about my mother that way. It's giving Malfoy, wait till my father hears about this. Why is he being so quick to trust his mother again? Because the plot needs it. Triss stomps off, good for her. Dump him. Chapter 26. Triss is woken up suddenly by Christina, who warns her that some of the Dauntless are under a simulation. They go to the roof where three Dauntless are standing on the ledge. Marlene, Hector, I don't know who that is, and a nameless Dauntless who is eight years old. I got this wrong. I thought, bet she dies then. If in doubt of your stakes, kill a child to manipulate the emotions of your audience. It works like a charm. This is not a negotiation. It is a warning, says the simulation through Marlene, moving her lips and vibrating in her throat. Every two days until one of you delivers yourself to Erudite headquarters, this will happen again. This. Marlene steps back and I throw myself forward, but not at her. Not at Marlene, who wants to let Yuria shoot a muffin off of her head on a dare, who gathered a sack of clothing for me to wear. Who always, always greeted me with a smile. No, not a while. What fantastic memories they are. You've got like two key memories. What a long-standing friendship. Tris saves Hector and Christina saves the child. Marlene is dead. Oh well, rip. I have a message for the Divergent. I am Divergent. This is not a negotiation. No, it is not. It is a warning. I understand. Every two days until one of you delivers yourself to Erudite headquarters. I will. This will happen again. It will never happen again. Gosh, she's not the only divergent to have ever existed. She just wants to die, not for nobility's sake, she just wants to die. Chapter 27. This morning, Lauren reported that we missed some of the cameras in the initiate dormitories where Christina, Zeki, Lauren, Marlene, Hector, and Key, the girl with the green hair, were sleeping. That's how Janine figured out who the simulation was controlling. I do not doubt that Janine chose Young Dauntless because she knew their deaths would affect us more. But you guys don't feel great about wasting your time with the paintball fight now, do you? I hear someone approaching and looks to the side. Christina, still wearing the same clothes she wore last night, stands a few feet away. Hey, she says. I'm not really in the mood to feel more guilt right now, so go away, please. Yes, Trish, you tell her. You establish your boundaries with people. You told me you had to do it, or he would have shot you, and I didn't believe you. I believe you now, and... I'm going to try to forgive you. That's all I wanted to say. There's a part of me that feels relief. She believes me. She's trying to forgive me, even though it won't be easy. But a larger part of me feels anger. What did she think before now? That I wanted to shoot Will, one of my best friends? She should have trusted me from the beginning. Should have known that I would have done it if I'd been able to see another option at the time. Yeah, you tell her. Triss gets mad, but then they hug and cry. Lynn thanks her for saving Hector. Triss goes to sit with Zeke and Yuria. I feel cautious around him. I saved Heck which means I failed to save Marlene. For Christ's sake, I know on one hand survivor's guilt is very real and it's very valid, but the people doing the killings are Janine and the Erudite, so can the Dauntless please just spend one moment not blaming each other or worrying about, like, they're going to be blamed. For... <sighs> Tobias turns up just to annoy me. They all decide that no one should sacrifice themselves to the Erudite. Triss goes to Tobias's room. The door opens and Tobias slips in. My arms go limp and the quilt falls into my lap. How will I explain my presence here? I'm supposed to be angry with him. He doesn't scowl, but his mouth is so tense that I know he's angry with me. Don't be an idiot, he says. An idiot? You were lying. You said you wouldn't go to Erudite and you were lying and going to Erudite would make you an idiot, so don't. Yeah, just react in anger. Good one, dickhead. <sighs> they get mad with each other, but then they end up kissing. Promise me, he whispers, that you won't go. For me. Do this one thing for me. Could I do that? <clears throat> Could I stay here, fix things with him, let someone else die in my place? Looking up at him, I believe for a moment that I could. Then I see Will. 
the crease between his eyebrows, the empty simulation bound eyes, the slumped body. Do this one thing for me. Tobias's dark eyes plead with me. But if I don't go to Erudite, who will? Tobias? It's the kind of thing he would do. I feel a stab of pain in my chest as I lie to him. Okay. Promise, he says, frowning. The pain becomes an ache, spreads everywhere, all mixed together, guilt and terror and longing. I promise. Get wrecked, Tobias. Chapter 28. Tris waits until Tobias falls asleep and she leaves. She wakes Christina, lies that she is going to see the abnegation, then tells her everything she knows about Marcus. The reason Janine forced us to attack innocent people, she said bitterly. Yeah, we need to know it. I had almost forgotten. She was under the simulation. How many abnegation did she kill, guided by the simulation? How did she feel when she awoke from that dream, a murderer? I have never asked, and I never will. Why not? That would make a great episode of The Hot Ones. Christina was also under the simulation, so she, you must remember what it was like. She, she probably killed people. Not her fault. She was a mind-controlled robot. But she had the audacity to be like really mad, like thinking Tris might have shot Will on purpose, even though she was in the simulation. She she knows that she... Okay, whatever, whatever. Tris walks all the way to the Erudite headquarters and hands herself in. Peter is there and takes her upstairs. Tris gets put into a room. It's very fascinating. Chapter 29. The thought makes my hands tremble, but I don't try to push it from my mind. Instead, I tell myself that I'm dauntless and I'm no stranger to fear. I will die in this place, perhaps soon. Those are the facts. But there are other ways to think of it. Soon I will honour my parents by dying as they died. And if all they believe about death was true, then I will soon join them in whatever comes next. Yeah, I'm sure her parents are going to be thrilled at the thought of dying to save her, only to have her die for nothing barely two weeks later. She didn't even try to work out an alternative around the erudite, not a proper one. She was just ready to go off and sacrifice herself at a moment's notice. Janine appears. Hello, Janine, I say, because it is the only thing that comes to mind. The erudite divergence really shines through, doesn't it? How does Peter find himself in such a prestigious position as Janine Matthews' bodyguard? Where is the logic in that? The book is becoming self-aware. It will devour us all in its despair. Why did that rhyme? Awful. Janine takes her on a tour. I am very pleased that you in particular are here, says Janine. She walks past me and perches on the table, her fingers curled round the edge. I am pleased, of course, because your absolute test results. Her blonde hair pulled tight to her skull reflects the light, catches my attention. Even among the divergent, you are somewhat of an oddity because you have an aptitude for free factions, abnegation, dauntless and erudite. <sighs> we know. We don't need constant reminders of how special Zoe Redbird is. The erudite are going to study Triss for as long as possible and then execute her. What does she think was going to happen? All in good time, she says. From your results, I have determined that you are one of the strongest divergents, which I say not to compliment you, but to explain my purpose. If I am to develop a simulation that cannot be thwarted by the divergent mind, I must study the strongest divergent mind in order to shore up all weaknesses in the technology. Understand. Triss being the most special divergent and handing herself over to the erudite is such an own goal for all the other divergents. Idiot. They take Triss to an MRI machine to scan her brain. Good luck. She bargains with Janine to let her see her own brain understand it better. Good luck again. Triss has a larger than average lateral prefrontal cortex. She's a galaxy brain. Not just that, Janine smiles a little. Blue light from the screens make her cheekbones and forehead brighter but cast shadows in her eye sockets. It does not merely indicate something about her behaviour but about her desires. She is not reward motivated. Yet she is extremely good at directing her thoughts and actions towards her goal. This explains both her tendency towards harmful but selfless behaviour and perhaps her ability to wiggle out of simulations. How does this change our approach to the new simulation serum? Congrats on giving your biggest enemy all the information they need, dummy. I did not know that my entire personality, my entire being, could be discarded as the byproduct of my anatomy. What if I really am just someone with a large prefrontal cortex and nothing more? Yeah, and so? In silence, Peter and I make our way back to my room. We turn left and a group of people stands at the other end of the hallway. It is the longest of the corridors we will travel through, but that distance shrinks when I see him. Held at either arm by a dauntless traitor, a gun aimed at the back of his skull. Tobias, blood trailing down the side of his face and marking his white shirt with red. Tobias, fellow divergent, standing in the mouth of this furnace in which I will burn. Go away, Tobias. I came here so that no one else would have to die. What did you do? I scream. You die, I die too. Tobias looks over his shoulder at me. I asked you not to do this. You made your decision. These are the repercussions. So annoying, even in death, go away. She doesn't need all of this guilt tripping. Triss cries to Peter. I think he came to die with me, I say. I clamp my hand over my mouth to stifle a sob. Stiffle, whatever. If, if I can keep breathing, I can stop crying. I didn't need to want him to die with me. I wanted to keep him safe. What an idiot, I think, but my heart isn't in it. 
That's ridiculous, he says. That doesn't make any sense. He's 18. He'll find another girlfriend once you're dead, and he's stupid if he doesn't know that. Oh my god, wait. Why am I Peter? Can you find out? I wipe my cheeks with the heels of my hands, frustrated. Can you at least find out if he's all right? He says, why would I do that? Why would I do anything for you? That's literally me. Chapter 30. I read somewhere, once, that crying defies scientific explanation. Tears are only meant to lubricate the eyes. There is no real reason for tear glands to overproduce tears at the behest of emotion. This is super believable 16-year-old internal dialogue. More tests with Janine. Aren't you supposed to be running a faction and planning a war, I say? What are you doing here, running tests on a 16-year-old girl? You choose different ways of referring to yourself depending on what is convenient, she says, leaning back in her chair. Sometimes you insist you are not a little girl, and sometimes you insist you are. What I am curious to know is, how do you really view yourself? As one or the other? As both? As neither. Based and good observation. I make my voice flat and factual like hers. I see no reason to provide that information. I hear a faint snort. Peter is covering his mouth. Janine glares at him and his laughter effortlessly transforms into a coughing fit. Mockery is childish, Beatrice, she says. It does not become you. Mockery is childish, Beatrice. Beatrice, I repeat in my best imitation of her voice. It does not become you. This is the least that Janine deserves for willingly hanging around teenagers. Tris gets injected with a serum. Tris is on a bus, this is a hallucination, obviously, with her mum going to the erudite headquarters. Relaying these serum-induced hallucinations is boring. Literally nothing happens apart from some glass explodes. Chapter 31. Trish dreams of her mother. I wake, wondering how I did not notice. Every day I sat across from her at the breakfast table, that she was full to bursting with dauntless energy. Was it because she hid it well, or was it because I wasn't looking? It's because you're always thinking about yourself. I bury my face into the thin mattress I slept on. I will never know her, but at least she will never know what I did to Will either. At this point, I don't think I could bear it if she did. Beatrice's mum killed loads of people to get to Beatrice. I'm sure she would get over Beatrice killing someone that her mum has never met in the first place. Or did she meet? I don't care. Why are you constantly escorting me to places? I say. Isn't there a depraved activity you're supposed to be taking part in? Kicking puppies or spying on girls while they change or something? I know what you did to Will, you know. Don't pretend that you're better than I am, because you and I were exactly the same. Stabbing someone for fun versus killing someone in self-defense isn't the same thing at all. But as far as I'm aware, Peter has a zero kill record, whereas Tris has a killing spree. So something, something ethics. Tris is being taken back to the room where she believes she will be executed. Surely not so soon, because they have barely done anything so far. But with the pacing in these books, you never know. Tris is tied to the table and Tobias limps in so Janine can threaten him with Tris. She injects Triss with a serum to overwhelm her with pure fear. It's quite dull. She watches Tobias stab herself and gets pecked by birds. Boring. They inject her with a sedative. That was not fear. That was something else. An emotion that should not exist. It was quite bland to read. You really didn't miss out on anything. Tobias tells Janine where the erudite safe houses are. So, no, the factionless safe houses are. So long as she stops tor torturing Triss. Janine reveals Caleb has been working with her and telling her stuff about Trith the entire time. Chapter 32. My head pounds. I can't make sense of it. I don't know why Caleb would betray me. I wonder when it happened. After the attack simulation? After the escape from Amity? Or was it earlier than that? Was it back when my father was still alive? Caleb told us he had left Erudite when he found out what they were planning. Was he lying? So, boring Caleb has apparently been a master manipulator his entire life which I don't buy, Roth. I think she threw this in as a like as a wrench in the works to create a U-turn, but where is the contextual evidence besides he was always reading, thus he's an erudite? I think this was just a random decision that she made one day, because there's no red herrings or nothing. And it's not like we know a lot about Caleb anyway, because most of, most of Roth's characters are shallow. So for me, this isn't some emotional gut punch. It's just annoying. And if he was an erudite spy all along, he sure did take seeing his parents die very hard. So, you know. No, well, I guess he's a spy, not heartless. But then again, he is helping to torture his little sister. So, do you know what I mean? You can't have it both ways, Roth. Because, trust me, none of these characters are that complex. Triss is escorted to the showers and sees Tobias, who faints, as in F-E-I, not F-A-N, and steals F-A-L-E-N. Oh my god, I can't even spell who he steals a gun and he starts blasting. Peter lets Triss and Tobias escape by doing nothing. Tobias is looking for something, he's not actually trying to escape. They hide in a supply closet. 
I didn't come here on some suicide mission, he says. I came for two reasons. The first was to find Erudite's two central control rooms so that when we invade, we'll know what to destroy first and get rid of all the simulation data so she can't activate the Dauntless transmitters. The second, he says, clearing his throat, is to make sure you hold on because we have a plan. What plan? According to one of our insiders, your execution is tentatively scheduled for two weeks from today, he says. At least that's Janine's target date for the new Divergent Proof simulation. So 14 days from now, the Factionless, the Loyal Dauntless, and the Abnegation who are willing to fight will storm the Erudite compound and take out their best weapon, their computer system. That means we'll outnumber the Traitor Dauntless and therefore the Erudite. What a fantastic plan. Two weeks. Will I be able to make it through two weeks of this? I'm already so tired, I'm finding it difficult to stand on my own. Even the rescue that Tobias is proposing barely appeals to me. I don't want freedom. I want sleep. I want this to end. She's only been captured for two days. What a baby. I can't force you. I can't make you want to survive this. He pulls me against him and runs his hand through my hair, tucking it behind my ear. His fingers trail down my neck and over my shoulder, and he says, but you will do it. It doesn't matter if you believe you can or not. You will, because that's who you are. What do you know? You've literally only known her for a month. I find it so tiresome in fiction when characters who like don't really know each other or if they've not seen each other in years and years are like, this is who you really are. So I've been watching the Daredevil TV series recently and I'm enjoying it. I am firmly adamant that the Punisher has done nothing wrong. And I'm up to the bit with like spoilers for this next book, obviously. I'm up to the bit where all the stuff with Elektra has happened and the Punisher has met Fisk, etc, etc. The Punisher has done absolutely nothing wrong. He was just killing criminals, big whoop. Oh, but he was violent. So, makes better TV, doesn't it? And I like everyone in the TV, everyone, right? Except for Electra, because I find it so boring when a character who hasn't seen another character in years come back to them and is immediately like, this is who you are. This is who you really are. Like, what would you know? People, ch if you haven't, people change incrementally, day by day, week by week right? Every time you go to bed, you wake up maybe the tiniest bit different. We have to always constantly adapt to survive to our surroundings, right? If if you've not changed in 10 years, you've stagnated, you've, you've done something like, right, if you're not, like, because even learning things and getting new experiences changes you slightly, right? With every new thing that you learn, rewires the brain a little, like tiny, tiny bit, tiny bit, builds up, yeah? So if you've not changed at all in 10 years and just how come along being like, uh, and then like messing up his, and then he, what a simp, allowing her to mess up his like, so annoying, so tight, like get a life, go away, stupid person. Like it's just eye roll worthy. This is who you really are, Matthew. What would you know? You've not seen him in like a decade. Shut up, you mug, go away. <laughs> and do you know what else annoyed me about that? Karen going into the apartment, seeing that, and then saying to a fog, what's his, is the same foggy or froggy, whatever, saying, I went over to Matt's apartment and there was a woman in his bed. So, in, so disingenuous. Yes, a woman covered in like blood and scratches and battle wounds and stuff. And a blind man in it. So disingenuous to act as though you caught him in the act shagging someone. Do you know what? Why don't I just write TV? Because I do better than everyone else. It's just infuriating, do you know what I mean? Anyway, actually that goes back to my previous point when there's, but I don't like it when there's misunderstandings that could so easily be cleared up just by one person saying something to another person, but that people don't want to hear it and then it causes a bigger kerfuffle than it actually is. Anyway, which Divergent didn't do, so. I don't want to tell him the truth that he is wrong and I do not want to survive this. Fair enough, doesn't make for a very compelling story, but who am I to judge? Chapter 33. New experiment time, Caleb is there. It is that simple, I want to yell, but instead my voice comes out flat. At what point did you betray our family? Before our parents died or after? I did what I had to do. You think you understand this, Beatrice, but you don't. This whole situation is much bigger than you think it is. His eyes plead with me to understand, but I recognise his tone. It's the one he employed when we were younger to scold me. It is condescending. What is Caleb's game plan? I had to Google to remember this, but Janine is aware of the outside world, but she doesn't want to rejoin. Even though, how would it be up to her anyway if the outside world is using the city as a social experiment how would it be up to janine whether she wants to resume them or not like why isn't the outside world just overwhelming them to force their way don't tell me that some u.s military base wouldn't intercede and force their way to get what they want ultimately don't rough it's a dystopia but it's not like a fairy tale la la land but the u.s army doesn't <laughs> interrupt someone else's business ain't that's not the point of this video no logic right I don't know if Caleb is aware that there is an outside city. I can't remember. 
if he isn't aware, then what is his game plan? What does he think's going on? And if he is aware, why the hell has he been trusted with it? He's like 16. Get a life. This isn't about erudite. It's about everyone. All the factions, he says. And the city. And what's outside the fence. I don't care, I say, but that isn't true. The phrase outside the fence prickles in my brain. Outside? How could any of this have to do with what's outside? Spoken like a true dauntless, says Caleb sharply. It's either one way or the other. No nuances. The world doesn't work like that, Beatrice. Evil depends on where you're standing. No matter where I stand, I'll still think mind controlling an entire people city of people is evil. I feel my lip wobble. I'll still think delivering your sister to be prodded and executed is evil. Here's my brother, but I want to tear him to pieces. Trace complains that Caleb took faction over blood too literally, but she's putting blood above all, which is also quite literal. But you all now, at this point, know my thoughts on this blood family genetic lottery you aren't obligated to love those related to you especially if they suck basically just dump Kayla get rid of him dump him you just know that she's going to think I hate my brother but my brother is also one my one remaining family member so I also love him which to me is just bogus nonsense but that's because I don't believe in unconditional love legitimately I don't I don't believe it I don't believe it's a so you know when you have these serial killers and their mums are always like, he was such a nice boy, even though he's always torturing and killing the neighbours' cats, but he won't hurt a fly. I just think these people are so like inured, so controlled by their own biology because they're not thinking properly, are they? Ah, oh, but look, sharp. This isn't a conversation that I'm actually willing to have because I just, I have, I apparently have different opinions to most of the rest of the world <laughs> when it comes to this. And if you found out that the person you supposedly loved, because they're your family member, was lying to you, potentially their entire life or your entire life, then what exactly are you loving? You're loving this fake, idealized version of them. You're loving something that doesn't actually exist. The subject of your love isn't real, ain't based in this reality. It's in your head. Therefore, how can it be real? Just dump him, dump everyone. Janine appears to tell Tris that she has a lot of mirror neurons, which means... What else are they responsible for? Janine scans her class the same way my teachers did in upper levels. Another erudite raises his hand. Learning language, understanding other people's intentions based upon their behaviour. Um, he frowns. And empathy. Great. Triss is an empath. What a shocking twist. Triss wants to die. Oh my god, same. Someone wakes Triss up. It's Tobias freeing her. But it's fake. We can't get out of here, I say, because this is a simulation. Told, told you, I'm smarter than all these book characters combined. I wake with tears in my eyes. I wake to Janine's scream of frustration. What is it? She grabs Peter's gun out of his hand and stalks across the room, pressing the barrel to my forehead. My body stiffens, goes cold. She won't shoot me. I am a problem she can't solve. She won't shoot me. What is it that clues you in? Tell me or, tell me or I will kill you. Which is a completely reasonable and rational response. You think I'm going to tell you, I say. You think that I believe you would kill me without figuring out the answer to this question? You stupid girl, she says. You think this is about you and your abnormal brain? This is not about you. It's not about me. It's about keeping this city safe from the people who intend to plunge it into hell. Right now, it kind of is a little bit about Triss though, isn't it? Triss punches Janine in the face, fine about time that someone did something. Chapter 34. Triss is back in her cell feeling sorry for herself. Peter arrives to tell her that her execution has been... Why can't I talk? Her execution has been scheduled for the next day. My execution? But she... She hasn't developed the right simulation yet. She couldn't possibly... She said that she will continue the experiments on Tobias instead of you, he says. Janine is being a big, angry baby. I could have forgiven you, you know, I say, for trying to kill me during initiation. I probably could have. We were both quiet for a while. I don't know why I told him that. Maybe just because it's true, and tonight of all nights is the time for honesty. Tonight I will be honest and selfless and brave, divergent. I never asked you to, he says and turns to leave. But then he stops at the door frame and says, it's 9.24. Telling me the time is a small act of betrayal and therefore an ordinary act of bravery it is maybe the first time I've seen Peter be truly dauntless. Quite like this moment, thought I'd include it. Problem? Good. I suppose that now would be the time to ask for forgiveness for all the things I've done, but I'm sure the list would never be complete. I also don't believe that whatever comes out of life depends on my correctly reciting a list of my transgressions. That sounds too much like an erudite afterlife to me, all accuracy and no feeling. I don't believe that what comes after depends on anything I do at all. I am better off doing as the abnegation taught me, turning away from myself, projecting always outwards, and hoping that in whatever is next, I'll be better than I am now. I smile a little. I wish I could tell my parents that I will die like the abnegation. They would be proud, I think. I like that too. Chapter 35. Today is the day that Tris dies. Ooh. Peter escorts her to the execution room, but lets her see Tobias. 
one last time. Good riddance, Tobias. I don't know where the pounding starts, but someone drums their fists against the wall and someone else joins in. And I walk down the aisle between Salem, Solemn, 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 what was that? Between Solemn but raucous, dauntless traitors, their hands in motion at their sides. The pounding is so fast, my heart races to keep up with it. Some of the dauntless traitors inclined their head to me. I'm not sure why. It doesn't matter. I'm assuming the pounding is in solidarity with Triss, but who is doing it? Other prisoners? Because we haven't seen any pr other prisoners yet. So, and then it was just done for effect, I suppose. It was stupid. Triss gets on the table. And then rising from within me as a single thought, I don't want to die. All those times Tobias scolded me for risking my life, I never took him seriously. I believed that I wanted to be with my parents and for all of this to be over. I was sure I wanted to emulate their self-sacrifice, but no, no, no. Burning and boiling inside me is the desire to live. Of course, she didn't actually want to die, really. It was just an appropriate amount of angst for the teenage audience. I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to. Janine steps forward with a syringe full of purple serum. Her glasses reflect the fluorescent light above us. I can barely see her eyes. Every part of my body chants it in unison. Live, live, live. I thought that in order to give my life in exchange for wills, in exchange for my parents, that I needed to die. But I was wrong. I need to live my life in the light of their deaths. I need to live. Lovely, but spoilers, this is all forgotten by the pointless end of the third book. She presses the plunger down. Peter leans forward and looks into my eyes. The serum will go into effect in one minute, he says. Be brave, Triss. Lovely. The heart monitor stops beeping. What a cliffhanger. Chapter 36. Triss is still alive, but Janine is unaware, so Peter takes Triss down to a room to be autopsied. But don't worry, that is not where the story is heading. I once, I think I read a short horror story where that happened once, where someone woke up during the middle of an autopsy. I think it was a Stephen King novella. Peter's arms slide under my knees and shoulders and he lifts me. My head falls against his shoulder. For someone so small, you're heavy stiff, he mutters. He knows I'm awake, he knows. I hear a series of beeps and a slide, a locked door opening. What do, Tobias's voice. Tobias, oh my God, oh. Spare me your blubbering, okay, Peter says. She's not dead yet. Nope, she's not dead, <laughs> not yet. She's just paralyzed. It'll only last for a minute, now get ready to run. How did Tobias get there without anyone noticing? All this CCTV and yet no one bothers to check it in this universe. What is the point? They escape via the trash chute. I look around. We are inside the incinerator, which would be completely dark if not for the lines of light glowing in the shape of the, a small door on the other side. The floor is solid metal in some places and metal grating in others. Everything smells like rotting garbage and fire. Don't say I never took you anywhere nice, Peter says. Wouldn't dream of it, I say. He may be a nutter, but Peter has more personality than Tobias, who is just mysteriously brooding all the time. They race away from the erudite and hide in a building, and Triss quizzes Peter. How did you do it, I say. It wasn't that hard, he says. I dyed a paralytic serum purple and switched it out with the death serum. Replaced the wire that was supposed to read your heartbeat with a dead one. The bit with the heart monster was harder. I had to get some erudite help with remote and stuff. You wouldn't understand it if I explained it to you. How convenient. Erudite aren't that smart to not check everything properly then. Where is the quality control? You're doing an execution. You think people would double check it. My Domino's does a better job of checking pizza than Erudite does check anything. They didn't check this. They don't check the CCTV. How, how did they organize themselves to mind control people in the first place? Why did you do it, I say. You want me dead. You were willing to do it yourself. What changed? He presses his lips together and doesn't look away, not for a long time. Then he opens his mouth, hesitates, and finally says, I can't be in anyone's debt, okay? The idea that I owed you something made me sick. I'd wake up in the middle of the night feeling like I was going to vomit. Indebted, indebted to a stiff? It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I couldn't have it. What are you talking about? You owed me something? He rolls his eyes. The Amity compound. Someone shot me. The bullet was at head level. It would have hit me right between the eyes and you shoved me out of the way. We were even before that. I almost killed you during initiation. You almost killed me during the attack. We're square, right? But after that, you're insane, says Tobias. That's not the way the world works with everyone keeping score. Well, so Peter would give up his position with the Erudite as Janine's right-hand man and his safety with the Erudite for a life debt. I don't believe that. And how did he get in the position of guarding Janine in the first place as well? More unexplained mysteries on the History Channel. They reach the abnegation sector just fine. Everyone is there and surprise see Triss is alive. They head to Tobias's old house. Tori, Harrison and Evelyn stand in the kitchen. Who is Harrison? <laughs> they go to Tobias's room. Let's take care of your... <clears throat> they wash up. I don't... I sound like I'm being strangled. My family is all dead or traitors. How can I... I'm not making any sense. The sobs take over my body, my mind, everything. He gathers me to him. 
and bath water soaks my legs. His hold is tight. I listen to his heartbeat and after a while find a way to let the rhythm calm me. I'll be your family now, he says. I love you, I say. No one would understand that reference even if I said it, so I won't. Chapter 37. Ten more chapters left. Let's go. The whole gang is at Tobias's house the next day. Together we go down the stairs, our footsteps thundering as they never would have been allowed to in my parents' house. My father used to scold me for running down the stairs. Do not call attention to yourself, he said. It's not courteous to the people around you. It is also just annoying to hear other people stomping around all the time. Dauntless are the most annoying faction confirmed. Why is it from Camtai and Marcus's house? I ask him. Evelyn kicked him out, said it was her house too, and he'd gotten used to it for years, and it was her turn, Tobias grins. It caused a huge blow up on the front lawn, but eventually Evelyn won. I glance at Tobias's mother. She is in the far corner of the room, talking to Peter and eating more eggs from another can. My stomach churns. Tobias talks about her almost reverently, but I still remember what she said to me about my transience in Tobias's life. On one hand, leave him alone, yeah, he's basically been an honorary orphan for the past however many years. You know, he disowned his own father, his mum disappeared. So let him enjoy it. But on the other hand, Tobias and his mum are both annoying so they can both get in the sea. Edward appears, not that one, unfortunately, but the one-eyed type. And he threatens Peter and then he wanders off. I don't know if you know this, Tobias says, but Edward is a little unstable. Excuse me, how dare you? He had his eye stabbed out. This is why I don't like Tobias. He is annoying and short-sighted when he wants to be. Edward has earned the right to be a little bit unstable. Leave him alone. That Drew guy who helped Peter perform that butter knife manoeuvre, Tobias says. Apparently, when he got kicked out of Dauntless, he tried to join the same group of factionless that Edward was a part of. Notice you haven't seen Drew anywhere. Did Edward kill him, I say? Nearly, Tobias says. Evidently, that's why the other transfer, Maya, Myra, I think her name was, left Edward. Too gentle to bear it. I feel hollow at the thought of Drew, almost dead at the hands of Edward. Drew attacked me too. So what? Don't tell me you feel sorry for Drew. They stabbed his eye out. Where if you go away? Triss's internal dialogue is insipid. They all laugh. We all laugh. And it occurs to me that I might be meeting Tobias's true faction. They are not characterised by a particular virtue. They claim all colours, all activities, all virtues and all flaws as their own. I don't know what binds them together. The only common ground they have, as far as I know, is failure. Whatever it is, it seems to be enough. I feel, as I look at him, that I'm finally seeing him as he is instead of how he is in relation to me. So how well do I really know him if I have not seen this before? She is so neggy, calling them all failures. <laughs> so rude. Failures by what standard? Because they didn't want to be a part of your stupid system and the fact that shut up. And now she's bemoaning how well does she actually know Tobias. I'd say barely, like you barely know him. You've been together for a month. Go away, you children. Triss goes to the abnegation headquarters and Marcus speaks to her about the info. I do actually, because I've seen what happens to people when they hear the truth. They look like they have forgotten what they were searching for and are just wandering around trying to remember. The truth is really quite anticlimactic, to be honest. Do you know why I can't suspend my disbelief that much about it? If we had this worldwide conference tomorrow on every TV about how Earth was just one giant social experiment the entire time to create a certain type of pet, whatever, I would barely be surprised. I really, I'd be like, you know, it makes sense. It makes sense. This is all just one giant fucking social experiment. I feel like I'm in a madhouse. Makes, wouldn't be surprised. So I don't care about this. Anyway, that is not the same thing as knowing what's outside the fence. Well, are you going to tell me or are you just going to dangle it over my head and make me jump for it? I did not come here for self-indulgent arguing. And no, I'm not going to tell you, but not because I don't want to. It's because I have no idea how to describe it to you. You have to see it for yourself. It is really not that hard to say we live in a society. Your parents died for you, it's true. But the reason your mother was in abnegation headquarters the night you were almost executed was not to save you. She didn't know that you were there. She was trying to rescue the file from Janine. And when she heard that you were about to die, she rushed to save you and left the file in Janine's hands. Everything could be resolved if the bureau overwatching this experiment just stepped in. Chapter 38. There's a meeting about their attack plan. Anyone shot with a simulation transmitter has to stay so they aren't mind controlled. The plan is to just go to the Erudite headquarters and wipe them out. Really um, convoluted. Yeah, says Christina. It's just invading a faction's headquarters and killing everyone. Isn't that what the Erudite did to abnegation? This is different. This is not an attack out of nowhere unprovoked, says Lynn, scowling at her. This is another pathetic attempt at moralising. It's not the same thing. The Erudite can't proclaim ignorance to their actions because they are smart scientists and everyone at the headquarters seems to be aware of what was actually up. I wouldn't lose any sleep over the Erudite leaders being killed 
fuck around and find out, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Tris lies to Tobias that she will stay at home from the attack, but really she's working out a way of getting those files from Janine. Chapter 39. This camera angle is abysmal. You can't see. I'm basically on top of my oven right now. I'm about to start frying myself up. Whatever. I really need an office. How can I, in good faith, sit here and say anything about feminism ever from the, from the sanctity of my kitchen? The jokes write themselves. What chapter did I get up to? Does, does anyone know? Does anyone know? Are you joking? Microsoft Word. It's not enough to log in with but on a computer that I've used before. Now I have to verify my. Are you? How dare you? How dare you speak to me in this? Bill Gates, I'll never forgive you. How? Oh. Brb. Do you know one of my biggest pet peeves is as well when you use two-factor authentication and you need to wait to receive the email or whatever and then they take ages to send you the email. I can't think of which company does it. There's a car. It might be Google itself actually. It might be YouTube itself. It'll be like, yeah, quickly verify from your phone and then you won't get it for like five or ten. Sort your shit out. Your service should be big enough. Anyway, I can't believe I have to verify my own identity. Don't you know who I am, computer? Should know, my name is on the computer. Yes, they signed in. Shut up, you mug. Bill Gates. Right, I'm very sure we got up to this bit and if I missed it, well, I am on a big time constraint with my sponsor. So if you missed it, just use your imagination and fill in the blanks. Chapter 39. Christina does Triss's makeup and they are dressed like Amity going to visit Marcus because of course, like any good female protagonist, Going off script here. From what I remember, Tris doesn't know the first thing about makeup because you know, like she's, it's like Bella Swan. Oh, they're pretty, but they don't think that they're actually pretty despite all the boys and they don't wear makeup. Oh no, no, because that's a sin against, is it a, is it an ultra religious zealot thing to not, why does my voice sound like this? To me, it sounds really raspy like right now. It sounds like, I sound like Miley Cyrus to myself in my head right now. Is it like a religious zealot thing to not be like, yeah, it is, isn't it? That's why all these female protagonists, oh, they're so pretty, except they don't think so. And they don't, they don't know the first makeup. How do I, it's not hard, Tris, put on a YouTube video. That's how my generation, how we all learn to do our makeup. Tanya Berg, get ready with me. It's from the North tens. North tens, that's stupid. From the tens, the 2010s. I trusted Christina to take up this mission when I thought I would die. So it seems stupid to not trust her now. I was worried she wouldn't want to come with me, but I forgot where Christina came from, Candor, where the pursuit of truth is more important than anything else. She may be dauntless now, but if there's one thing I've learned, I didn't include it, so she's learned nothing. Good day, sir. Is the, blah, 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 blah. is the pursuit of truth and the pursuit of knowledge not the same thing? Because for knowledge to be true knowledge, does it not have to be true? In the first place, yes, I've covered that tiny little bit of my philosophy course. Can you tell? Marcus picks them up in a van, literally like a nonce with an ice cream van saying free candy on the side. I stole it from the factionless. They fixed them up. It wasn't easy to get it to start. Better ditch those jackets, girls. Nonce. They reach the gate, they make up some shit to the guards and they're let on through easily. Everyone half asses security in these novels. Thank God, otherwise nothing would, like literally nothing would ever get done if people were only doing half of their jobs. After a few seconds, Marcus glances at Christina. What on earth was that? There's nothing the Dauntless hate more than cheerful amity babble, says Christina, lifting a shoulder. I figured if he got annoyed, it would distract him and he would let us through. Christina is low-key much smarter than the other Dauntless, including Triss. Except, says Marcus, Joshua is not an abnegation name. How is it not? Joshua is almost as Christian as you can get, you Bible basher. Jesus's real name is Yeshua. I've probably mispronounced that. It's Hebrew. I apologize. Which translates to Joshua in English. So do not take the Lord's name in vain. I am not even lying. I'm not hyperbolizing. This is true. My fan theory of the Bible is that we don't call Jesus Joshua because Joshua H. Christ sounds a bit funny. It don't have the same ring to Jesus H. Christ, does it? That's my theory. The Lord Josh sounds a bit... Josh, the son of God. Not as mystical as people would maybe want it to be. How does Roth not know her own religion as well as I do? I bet she is one of those Americans who thinks that Jesus spoke English. It's true, some people think that. I, 
think I realized that as a teenager, like, wait, Jesus didn't even speak English. If he didn't exist, he didn't even speak English. And that was a mind blowing moment, but I was probably 13 when I figured that one out. These same people think he was like blonde, blue eyed, you know, like really light skin. Bro, he was born in the, in the middle of the Middle East. Critical thought should be taught in schools, not just RA. They find Joanna picking raspberries. I don't see why anyone chooses to live in the city and why they don't all choose to live in Amity. You get free drugs, you get music, picking fruit for labor, sign me up. She shifts her focus to me about question, but I can tell by the wary look in her eyes that she would rather talk to Marcus. She would deny it if I asked her, but I am almost certain that she <laughs> But I am almost certain that Joanna Ray's of light hates me. What is going on? Why, why does Joanna hate her? She's like leader of the hippies, why? Tris explains what's going on just to keep Joanna in the loop. I also wanted to ask you if we can talk to the erudite you're keeping safe here, I say. I know they're hidden, but I need access to them. And what do you intend to do? She says, shoot them, I say, rolling my eyes. That isn't funny. <laughs> Bro, you need something from this woman, so don't be rude about it, you dumbass. Like. Has no one in this novel ever read how to make friends and influence people? Like, sorry, Triss has an affinity for erudite, but she acts stupid all the time. Anyway, they stay the night. Triss wakes up early and watches the Amity perform a religious ritual and she joins in. They all hold hands and pray to our Lord Joshua and then Triss runs away and cries. There is a meeting now. Joanna asks that Amity gets involved to protect Erudite from being wiped out. Triss speaks to Kara, Will's sister. I try to forget what she said about my nose, but it's hard. Yeah, well, you shot and killed her brother. Get over it. The meeting lasts for another hour. Like one of these things is not like the other. By then, the rain has stopped, though water still sprinkles the wall and ceiling panels. Christina and I have been, I feel like, you know, episode of Friends where um, Phoebe gets a cold and then she thinks she sounds really sexy when she sings. Like, what's she doing? She's like coughing like, like through Smelly Cat. That's how I feel right now. Sexy in a I smoke a hundred cigarettes a day kind of way. Christina and I have been sitting against one of the walls, playing a game in which each of us tries to pin down the other's thumb. She always wins. This is called Thumb War, Roth. The rest of us don't live underground. Amity vote to stay uninvolved and Triss thinks that they are cowards. I don't know. I wouldn't risk my life to protect dumb factions either. Joanna decides to leave the group to go help and other Amity leave with her. Chapter 40. The Erudite Dormitory. Well, first of all, this important data you want to rescue, she says, putting it on a disc. Oh, she's talking to Kara. It's a ridiculous idea. Discs just end up breaking or in the wrong person's hands like all other physical objects. I suggest you make use of the data network. The what? She glances at the other erudite. One of the others, a brown skinned young man in glasses says, go on, tell them. There's no reason to keep secrets anymore. Kara looks back at me. Many of the computers in the erudite compounds are set up to access data from the computers in other factions. That's how it was so easy for Janine to run the attack simulation from a dauntless computer instead of an erudite one. Wow, a dystopian future with super advanced technology has never heard of the cloud system before. Kara removes her glasses and snaps them in half at the bridge. Stunning and brave. One of the erudite has a disc that emits a high pitched frequency that can shatter glass. She picks up a black box made of plastic, small enough for her to wrap her fingers around it. At the top of the box are two pieces of metal that look like teeth. She flips a switch at the bottom of the box and a thread of blue light stretches across the gap between the teeth. It's a taser. How is this impressive in a world that has guns? Also, cop my, cop my merch. That's all. Might do some limited edition Christmas. Well, I wanted to do a limited edition Halloween one, but considering we are like halfway through October, maybe not. What did my mother say in that simulation? I worry that your father's blustering about erudite has been to your detriment. What if she was right? Even if she was just part of a simulation? My father taught me to see erudite in a particular way. He never taught me that they made no judgments about what people believed, but designed things for them within the confines of those beliefs. He never told me that they could be funny or that they could critique their own faction from the inside. Kara lunges towards Fernando with a stunner, laughing when he jumps back. He never told me that an erudite could offer to help me, even after I killed her brother. This just in, human being realises to not judge people based upon a few characteristics. Incredible epiphany. Hello, Joanna, says Marcus. Marcus, she says, I hope you don't mind if we accompany you to the city. When are these two just going to fuck? The sexual tension is palpable through these pages. They all head back into the city. In the midst of meeting new people and making plans, I forgot that my plan is to walk straight into a battle that could claim my r life, right after I realised that my life was worth living. This is just like when Homer eats the poisonous puffer fish and thinks he's going to die, and he resolves to live life fully, but in the credits he's just sitting there eating chips and watching TV. 
I nod, but I am really thinking of Caleb. He was one of the informants. I wonder why he believes so strongly that the outside world should be hidden from us that he would betray everyone he supposedly cared about for Janine who cares about no one. Why would he be told what's on the outside? He is 16. Come on, be realistic, Roth. Why are people entrusting a teenager with state secrets? The president in our world is not on a need to know basis about aliens because a presidency is just a temporary job position for four or eight years, depending on how much people like you. Pretty sure it's the same with prime ministership in the UK. I really should know that about my own government, but alas. Our own leaders aren't allowed to know about aliens, none of their business. But some teen in a fictional novel is told a secret so big, all the factions would crumble as they know it. People are having a war over this information. People are dying. But a 16 year old is in the need to know. Okay, chapter 41. Fernando hops out of the truck bed and offers me his arm. Come on, insurgent, he says with a wink. What? I say. I take his arm and slide down the side of the truck. He opens the bag he was sitting with. It is full of blue clothes. He sorts through them, tossing garments to Christina and me. I get a bright blue t-shirt and a pair of blue jeans. All of the factions dress according to their faction colours. I would be dauntless. I only ever wear black. Oh, I hate this for me. Insurgent, he says. Noun. What are you, a dictionary? A person who acts in opposition to the established authority who is not necessarily regarded as a belligerent. Fernando has a personality, so I bet he dies soon. Tris takes the taser. My heart beats so hard it marks each second for me, but for the, but the rest of me is numb. I can barely feel the ground. I've never been this afraid anymore, and considering all that I have seen in simulations and all that I did during the attack simulation, that doesn't make any sense. Or maybe it does. Whatever the abnegation we're about to share everyone before the attack, it was enough to make Janine take drastic and terrible measures to stop them. And now I am about to finish their work. The work my old faction died for. So much more than my life is at stake now. All the more reason the third book is so anticlimactic and dry. They are stopped by a simulation-controlled candle in front of the Erudite headquarters. They decide to break into the headquarters via a window. Everything these people do feels really it, that feels like child logic oh there's a window up there let's just like go to the building closest to it get a ladder and crawl. do you know what i mean that is like some cartoon level logic whatever chapter 42 i lean out over the alley and shout hey they're already in the building by the way then i duck as fast as i can but i don't hear gunshots good i think they don't respond to noise that's um odd she tries to turn too soon the ladder smacks into fernando's shoulder oh sorry nando the jolt knocked his glasses askew. He smiles at Christina and takes the glasses off, shoving them into his pocket. Nando, I say to him. I thought the erudite didn't like nicknames. When a pretty girl calls you by a nickname, he says, it is only logical to respond to it. Cheeky Nando's is deaf gonna die. They shattered the windows at the headquarters using that disc thing. Why do I just want to say that the, like, the disc voice thing is James Corden? I've got, really got the hump with him today. Hmm. No further context is needed. At any given time, any British person... Has the hump with James Corden. The next day. Tris manages to make it to the other side via a bathroom window but an erudite woman is in there. My apologies, I say. I try to adopt the formal speech common to the erudite. I am slightly edgy with everything that's occurring. We are re-entering in order to retrieve some of our test results from Laboratory 4A. Oh, the woman says. That seems rather unwise. The data is of the utmost importance, I say, trying to sound as arrogant as some of the erudite I've met. I would rather not leave it to get riddled with bullets. It's hardly my place to prevent you from trying to recover it, she says. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm going to wash my hands and take cover. What a boring conversation. Sounds good, I say. I decide not to tell her she has toilet paper on her shoe. Queen of petty. Everyone gets over except Fernando. The spectacles fall, hit the edge of the ladder and topple to the pavement. In a wave, the candle below twists and fire upward. Fernando yells and collapses against the ladder. One bullet hit his leg. I didn't see where the others went, but I know when I see blood drip between the rungs of the ladder that it was not a good place. Fernando stares at Christina, his face ashen. Christina surges forward, though through the window, about to reach for him. Don't be an idiot, he says, his voice weak. Leave me. Here's the last thing he says. Called it. I'm a genius. Or I've read this before and I totally forgot this and this character, but I actually knew the truth the whole time. Plato and the Menno problem was right. All knowledge is innate. I have won the riddle. I have solved that. I'm the biggest brain of our generation. Chapter 43. They continue on. Tris forgot the stun gun in the bathroom because she's a nitwit. They get to the control room easily to send the data, but Caleb appears. We're here to save the erudite data that the factionless wants to destroy, I say. I don't think you want to stop us. That's not true, he says. He jerks his head towards Marcus. Why would you bring him if you weren't trying to find something else? Something more important to him than all the erudite data combined. She told you about him, Marcus says. You? 
a child. She didn't tell me at first, Caleb says, but she didn't want me to choose a side without knowing the facts. He is still just a child though, seriously. Does no one in this series have any actual adults they can rely on? I don't care to hear anymore. While Caleb stares down Marcus, I turn and kick hard at Caleb's wrist. The impact shocks him and his gun topples from his hands. I slide it across the floor with my toes. You need to trust me, Beatrice, he says, his chin wobbling. No one in this life needs to do anything. After you helped her torture me, after you let her almost kill me, I didn't help her torch. You certainly didn't stop her. You were right there and you just watched. What could I have done? What? You could have tried, you coward. I scream so loud my face gets hot and tears jump into my eyes. Tried and failed because you love me. Shoot him. Caleb tells them that the information isn't there, so Marcus knocks him out and they head to Janine's lab. All I can see when I look at him is a belt swinging towards Tobias and the butt of a gun slamming into Caleb's jaw. I don't care that he hurt Caleb, I would have done it too, but that he is simultaneously a man who knows how to hurt people and a man who parades around as the self-effacing leader of the abnegation suddenly makes me so angry I can't see straight, especially because I chose him. I chose him over Tobias. Yeah, whilst that undeniably sucks, there's quite a conflict, there are much bigger things to worry about in the middle of the battlefield. Shut up, I shout shoving him hard into the wall. He is too surprised to push back. I hate you, you know that. I hate for you for what you did to him and I'm not talking about Caleb. I lean close to his face and whisper. And while I may not shoot you myself, I will definitely not help you if someone tries to shoot you, so, to kill you. So you'd better hope to God we don't get into that situation. There is zero time for this infighting and melodrama. This is clearly why you should trust everything to teenagers. Edward is blocking their way so they fight. Christina gets shot, so does Edward, yada, yada, yada. Marcus and Tris ditch Christina, chapter 44. They continue to the lab. Tris gets locked in a room where a robot voice recognizes her as Divergent and an intruder and then releases blue fog. Then the lights lift and I stand in the Dauntless training room in the circle in which we used to spar. I have so many mixed memories of the circle, some triumphant like beating Molly and some haunting, Peter punching me until I fell unconscious. I sniff and the air smells the same. Peter punching me, Peter punching me. Peter Piper picked a pickle, pickle peppers. Peter punching me, Peter punching me, Peter punching me. I sniff and the air smells the same, like sweat and dust. Across the circle is a blue door that doesn't belong here. I frown at him. Intruder, the voice says, and now it sounds like Janine, but that could be my imagination. You have five minutes to reach the blue door before the poison will kick in. What? That's all she ever says. What? Oh good, more theatrics, just like the end of the last book. I don't care about the rubbish justification of how the erudite just like doing experiments. If you think someone is a serious threat in a war, you don't want to ponce around with them and give them every opportunity to win or escape. You just finish them. I'll be a merciless war general, you all know it. Triss sees her reflection, her own reflection attacks her. That, I realise, as I clutch my stomach, is exactly what I would have done if I'd been in her position. Which means that in order to defeat her, I have to think of a way to defeat myself. And how can I be a better fighter than myself if she knows the same strategies I know and is exactly as resourceful and clever as I am? This is like the age-old conundrum. If you meet your clone, an exact copy, do you fight or do you fuck? The fight, because then you would get to see... In a, in a match where you're so evenly matched, you would get to see if you're better than... Do you know what I mean? But because no one knows you better than yourself, if you fight, you'd ex you'd face this problem that Triss is getting. Some people like that, some people don't. Except the difference is, and we're talking about clones here, not this weird imagination land. Your clone has only just popped into existence, hasn't even experienced life of their own yet. So it'd be like fighting a desperate version of yourself pumped up on steroids. And if you decided to fuck your clone, because after all, your clone is like you. No, your clone is you. So wouldn't it just be like extended masturbation? <laughs> no one knows you better than you know yourself. Your clone would know everything you like, everything you dislike. Wouldn't it be the perfect coming together of a sort? Except, as soon as your clone began their existence, they are a different person from you because they have different memories, different experiences, as soon as they popped into existence. So you're basically just fucking a stranger who looks exactly like you. I think this is less of an age-old question and more of an article that I read on crack.com once. I'm 100% certain. The logical puzzle. In a fight between two perfect equals, how can one win? I see the door over her shoulder and I realise we have different goals. As if I just got an email about a payment I made to Microsoft. For what? For them forgetting who I am? How dare you? I see the door over her shoulder and I realise we have different goals. I have to get through that door. She has to protect it. But even in a simulation, there is no way she is as desperate as I am. See, this is the inverse of what I just said. I sprint towards... That sounds exactly the same. 
I sprint towards the edge of a circle where there is a table. A moment ago, it was empty, but I know the rules of simulations and how to control them. A gun appears on it as soon as I think it. So what is the point of having this fog that induces simulations to protect the room when Divergence can control them? The room, the audio voice recognised her as Divergent. Theatrics. Makes, makes no sense. So why not release the poison gas immediately and be done with it? This is stupid. Her double keeps morphing into Will and Triss finally faces her fears and shoots Will again. Chapter 45. Triss gets through to the next room and hears Tori speaking to Janine. Tori's voice. How did she get through that simulation? Is she divergent too? I am 100% sure that she is. The reasons for my actions are beyond your understanding, Janine says. I was willing to make a sacrifice for the greater good, something you have never understood, not even when we were classmates. It was at this moment that I realised I fucked up. I thought Tori was about 20, maybe like 27. She's in her 40s. She has been in her 40s this entire time. This... She sounded like a 20 year old this entire time, but no, she's 40 plus. Tori shoots Janine, but hits her leg. So Triss and Tori fight, but Triss gets the upper hand. I didn't take you for a traitor, Triss, she says. And it sounds like a snarl, not a sound any human can make. I'm not, I say. I blink the tears down my cheeks so she can see, I can see her better. I can't explain it right now, but all I'm asking is for you to trust me, please. There's something important, something only she knows the location of. That's right, says Janine. It is on that computer, Beatrice, and only I can locate it. If you don't help me survive this, it will die with me. She is a liar, says Tori. A liar, and if you believe her, you're both an idiot and a traitor, Triss. See, grow up, she sounds like a child. I do believe her, I say. I believe her because it makes perfect sense. The most sensitive information that exists is hitting on that computer, Tori. I take a deep breath and lower my voice. Please listen to me. I hate her as much as you do. I have no reason to defend her. I'm telling you the truth. This is important. Tori is silent. I think for a moment that I've won, that I've persuaded her. But then she says, nothing is more important than her death. Immature. Tori has had enough, so she stabs Janine to death. Chapter 46. A moment later, the glass door opens again. Tobias and Yuria storm in as if to fight a battle. Yuria coffin, probably from the poison, but the battle is done. Janine is dead. Tori is triumphant, and I am a dauntless traitor. And I don't care. Tobias stops in the middle of a step, almost stumbling over his feet when he sees me. His eyes open wider. She is a traitor, says Tori. She almost shot me to defend Janine. Grow up. You are literally almost middle-aged. Act like it. You know why I'm here, I say quietly, don't you? I hold out Tori's gun. He walks forward, a little unsteady on his feet, and takes it. We found Marcus in the next room, caught in a simulation, Tobias says. You came up here with him. Yes, I did, I say, blood from Tori's bite trickling down my arm. I trusted you, he says, his body shaking with rage. I trusted you, and you abandoned me to work with him. Grow up as well. Grow up. I really don't like him. No, I shake my head. He told me something and everything my brother said, everything Janine said while I was in Erudite headquarters fits perfectly with what he told me. And I wanted, I needed to know the truth. The truth, he snorts. You think you learned the truth from a liar, a traitor and a sociopath? You know, there's literally no harm in any of them just checking Janine's computer for this mysterious info that will verify whether Marcus is lying or not. It would take like five minutes, an hour. They have the time. They've just won. And it's right there. But they all want to be melodramatic and let their personal problems get in the way of things. It is insufferable to read. I think that you are a liar, I say, my voice quaking. You tell me you love me, you trust me, you think I'm more perceptive than the average person. And the first second that belief in my perceptiveness, that trust, that love is put to the test, it all falls apart. I'm crying now, but I'm not ashamed of the tears shining on my cheeks or the thickness in my voice. So you must have lied when you told me all those things. You must have, because I can't believe your love is really that feeble. Dump him! Enough of this, says Tori. Take her downstairs. She'll be tried along with all the other war criminals. The computer is right there, you donuts. Impulsive, reckless idiots. How did society even last this long with morons like this in charge? How did Dauntless not blow themselves up already? Yuria takes Triss downstairs but gives her a bandage for her wounds so he's not totally a robot. Honestly, why do these guys want to fight the mind control simulation so much when all they do is defer to orders from authority anyway? No free thinkers. For the first time, the Dauntless's disregard for age does not seem like an opportunity. It seems like the thing that will condemn me. They will not say, but she's young, she must have been confused. They will say, she is an adult and she made her choice. In what universe is a 16 year old an adult? Shut up. Triss is taken to Christina to have a little chill and catch up, XXX. Tobias comes to take Caleb to disable Janine's security so they can check her computer. Finally, morons. Christina sits up straighter. Maybe she feels the same way. Or the poison somehow contains a transmitter. I hadn't thought of that. But how did Tori get past? She's not divergent. I tilt my head. I don't know. 
Maybe she is. Her brother was. And asked what happened to him. She might never admit it, no matter how accepted it becomes. I think she is. And this is, dare I say, not a plot hole. I think people nowadays get mistaken by what plot holes actually are. Plot holes are mistakes that don't make sense within the context of a story. Things that the author just wants you to ignore because otherwise the story falls apart. For example, at the end of Karate Kid, LaRusso in the match wasn't allowed to kick Johnny in the head, but he did and he won. That's a plot hole. This is not a plot hole. I think this is just simply leaving up to the audience's imagination for you to for you to just think for yourself a little bit. Hmm, what is she? Because I think Peter is a divergent. I think Tori is. I don't know why I bothered to say any of that. Lynn comes in in a stretcher. She's been shot in the stomach. All of these names and I still can't really keep track of who is who. I didn't even know that Tori was 40. They have an erudite doctor look at her. The doctor purses her lips and I know that Lynn is as good as dead. Fix her, says Yuria. You can fix her, so do it. On the contrary, the doctor says, looking up at him. Because she set the hospital floors on this building on fire, I cannot fix her. There are other hospitals, he says, almost shouting. You can get stuff from there and heal her. Her condition is far too advanced, the doctor says, her voice quiet. If you had not insisted upon burning everything that came into your path, I could have tried. But as the situation stands, trying would be worthless. What is this? The consequences of my reckless actions? The Dauntless make a terrible anything. Terrible army, terrible police, terrible insurgents, terrible rubbish. They are the epitome of cutting off your nose to spite your face. If Yuria doesn't have some guilt over these actions in the third book, then I don't care. I won't do anything because I don't care either way. Yuri says Lynn, shut up, it's too late. Yuria lets his gun clatter to the ground and grabs Lynn's hand, his lip quivering. I'm her friend too, I say as the factionless pointing guns at me. Can you at least point guns at me from over there? Since when were they maids? I'm just glad I didn't die while under the simulation, she says weakly. You're not going to die now, he says. Don't be stupid, she says. Yuri, listen, I loved her too. I did. You loved who, he said, his voice breaking. Marlene, says Lynn. Yeah, we all loved Marlene, he says. No, that's not what I mean. She shakes her head. She closes her eyes. That's why she was jealous and like threw things or I don't know. She got jealous. The book's only LGBT character, I think. And she dies. <laughs> Rip. Right, he sniff it. Nope. Right, he sniffs and pe- right, he sniffs and presses his palm. Really? Is it that hard? Right, he sniffs and presses his palm to Lynn's face. I wonder if her cheek is still warm. I don't want to touch her and find that it's not. My intrusive thoughts would have me poking at her cheek. Like when you're a kid and you're in the supermarket and you're in the fish section and you poke the eyes of the dead fish like through the plastic covering. Did anyone else do that? Or was it just me? Okay, Peter, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm vegan. Trust me. Please don't send the activists after me. Chapter 47. My mind keeps tugging me towards my memories of Lynn. Were they actually even friends? I've just read this book and fuck if I remember. Tris is like that person on Facebook who, when someone random dies, starts posting about how they were so close. We all know someone like that is infuriating. You know what I mean? You know when some people want to hijack other people's grief. We all grieve in different ways, but I mean, I'm not justifying. I'm not being harsh. It is annoying when you see... experienced that too and it's just like you didn't even like you didn't even talk to each other what you whatever anyway anyway (laughs) it's not about you it's not about me it's about this book (sighs) the dauntless bring janine's body down for everyone to gawk over i stare up at her body which seems so much smaller in death than it did in life i think roth could become a good writer maybe she has since this i don't know if she wasn't tied down to trying to wring out a three book series out of this one story so I quite like that. It seems smaller and definite didn't. I like that. Joanna steps up to chat shit and gets banged. What? Chat shit, get banged. Colour fills her cheeks and I think it again that Joanna Rees, Rays might still be beautiful. Except now I think that she isn't just beautiful in spite of the scar. She's somehow beautiful with it. Like Lynn with her buzzed hair, like Tobias with the memories of his father's cruelty that he wears like an armour. Like my mother in her plain grey clothing. I'm sure Joanna will be very pleased to hear she now fits your definition of beauty. Since you are still so very generous, says Tori, I wonder if you might carry a message back to the Amity. I don't feel comfortable leaving you and your army to dole out justice as you see fit, says Joanna, but I will certainly send someone else to Amity with a message. Fine, says Tori. Tell them that a new political system will soon be formed that will exclude them from representation. This, we believe, is their just punishment for failing to choose a side in this conflict. They will, of course, be obligated to continue... I'm getting so, um, that's actually triggered me. 
That's actually triggered me. You're not allowed in society, but we're still going to take all your food. I better not open a fucking history book. I'll literally have a heart attack. <sighs> they will, of course, be obligated to continue to produce and deliver to food this someone assassinate this girl. But they will be... Woman, actually. Sorry, she's in her 40s. But they will be under supervision by one of the leading factions. Oh, look. The fascists have been defeated by a new wave of fascism. Her, her, the, the. Hooray. Free cheers for progress. Fine, she says. I'm going to go do something useful. I don't suppose you would allow us, some of us to come in here and tend to these wounded. Tori gives her a look. I didn't think so, says Joanna. Do remember, though, that sometimes the people you oppress become mightier than you would like. Shoot Tori, shoot Tori. Trist notices the factionless have taken all the guns. Evelyn appears and shoots at the, tr the portrait of Janine. Well, odd, mate. Good one. The faction system that has long supported itself on the backs of discarded human beings will be disbanded at once, says Evelyn. We know this transition will be difficult for you, but we, Tori breaks in, looking scandalised. What are you talking about, disbanded? What I am talking about, says Evelyn, looking at Tori for the first time, is that your faction, which up until a few weeks ago was clamouring along with the erudite for the restriction of food and goods to the factionless, a clamour that resulted in the destruction of abnegation, will no longer exist. Evelyn smiles a little. And if you decide to take up arms against us, she says, you will be hard pressed to find any arms to take up. I have zero sympathy for Dauntless. This is what they deserve. Shoot Tori. I instructed my half of the army to relieve your half of the army of their weapons as soon as their missions were complete. Oh great, she's monologuing, says Evelyn. I see now that they were successful. I regret the duplicity, but we knew that you have been conditioned to cling to the faction system like it is your own mother and that we would have to help to ease you into this new era. Ease us, Tori demands. She pushes herself to her feet and limps towards Evelyn, who calmly takes her gun in hand and points at Tori. I have not been starving for more than a decade just to give in to a dauntless woman with a leg injury, Evelyn says. So unless you want me to shoot you, take a seat with your fellow ex-faction members. Based. Tobias appears to bother me some more. You were right, Tobias says quietly, balancing on the balls of his feet. He smiles a little. I do know who you are. I just needed to be unreminded. Too little, too late, you arsehole. Shut up. Shut up. I do know who you are. You've known each other for a month. No one is anyone. Shut up. Had enough. I'm going on my phone now because I just don't want to speak about this anymore. Of course, Triss forgives him because she has a simp and gives him a smooch. I press into the distance between us until it is gone, crushing the secrets we have kept and the suspicions we have harboured. For good, I hope. <sighs> Guess what the entire third book is about? Tobias plays the info that they hacked from Janine's computer. It's a woman talking about human cruelty. That, tell me something I'm not aware of every single second of the day. That is why you are so important, Amanda says. Our struggle against violence and cruelty is only treating the symptoms of a disease, not curing it. You are the cure. That worked out really well, didn't it? The reason I'm leaving this footage for you is so that you will know when it's time to help us. You will know that it is time when there are many among you whose minds appear to be more flexible than the others. The name you should choose to give these people is Divergent. Once they become abundant among you, your leaders should give the command for Amity to unlock the gate forever so that you may emerge from your isolation. So, the city is Chicago. And to protect Chicago and its citizens from the external cruelty of the horrible outside world, all the violence and murder and wars and armies and whatever, Janine decided to murder divergence and cause war and kill innocent people internally. Incredible flawless logic. The woman in the video is Edith Pryor and I think that's Triss's mum. The video stops, the projector grows blue against the wall. I clutch Tobias's hand, there is a moment of silence like a withheld breath. Then the shouting begins. What a cliffhanger, here's the acknowledgements. Thank you God for keeping your promises. What did God promise you? A quadruple movie deal because you only ended up getting free anyway that is the end of this video i hope you enjoyed it i hope you remember to like comment subscribe because i deserve it when i do these big behemoth videos well if this video does as well as the first one the first one did really well i will do the third by like i don't know november or something all right deal deal make sure you check out the divergent make sure you check out the house of night series i'm doing twilight etc etc make sure that you download and play raid shadow legends a free mobile game and that's all really oh check out my podcast channel check out my third channel and i'll see you guys next time bye